this is the first event that we've had, the first workshop, and uh, it's something that I've spent a lot of time on over the years, understanding historic buildings and realizing that uh, there are absolutely no two the same. Um, even if there are identical houses built next to each other, um, they're still radically different. So the goal of this is for everyone to sort of get an understanding of how they're going to look at what they have, right? Um, you know, some might, might be looking at multiple buildings that, that want to, uh, you know, that are helping out other, other people. Um, others uh, have their own home that they want to figure out sort of what's going on with it. And so the point of this is to help you sort of understand sort of those dynamics that contribute to inefficiency and how that inefficiency becomes the uh, means in which that, that we're trying to figure out the best way to intervene. Because um, Dwayne and I, uh, Dwayne has been doing this for a long time, uh, 20 years or so, right? More, more, more. So, uh, you know, it's, it's something that, that we're always sort of trying to figure out, okay, well, this is what the people want. Um, but then again, this is what the building is going on. It's in, it's in this building. Uh, so it's really our, our role to sort of help separate uh, what we're throwing in as our opinion, and that's science, right? And the beautiful thing is, is that there is science. And later on today, around 10 o'clock or so, uh, we're gonna have Ocean State Energy Audits. I've been working with Ken and his team for um, I don't know, about 10 years or so. And Ken is uh, the owner of the company. Um, he's BPI certified, which is Building Performance Institute. Uh, and uh, he performs energy audits pro you know, for private customers as well as uh, builders that are building new houses. Um, because that's a whole other code issue as to building a new house. You can no longer build them as drafty as this building. Um, <laughs> and uh, <Lucky> you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and I'm really glad they offered me to buy this building. I'm like, no, nah, that's okay. Um, now I know too much, so they'll never, you know, unless they give me a sweetheart deal. But um, so, what you know, what I do with Ken is. Uh, is bring him in to provide sort of that scientific ana scientific analysis of the building. And it's my role to say, okay, Ken, this is how the building's built. And he kind of knows that already, but this is how it's built. This is what I've seen. Um, and so it makes it easier for him. He's only up in there for the science part. And then we sort of fill in all the other parts, right? Um, so when Ken and I talk after the assessment, he might say, oh, well, I think we need to blow an in insulation in all these spots. And I say, yeah, no way, no how, because we've got flashing issues, we've got air infiltration issues, we've got moisture in the basement issues. Um, you know, I've, I've walked with him through 18th century homes um, and says, we're not putting any insulation, because you can't on any of your walls, um, we're gonna use a lot of backer rod, right? And, and so it's something that, you know, um, and then the beauty of it is I can bring him in after we do all the retrofits and he can do his blower door test again. And we're going to have a blower door test set up in here so everybody's going to be able to see that. So, um, first thing I wanted to find out, and I, and I kind of know some of your houses, um, but tell me a little bit about your house. Like, I'm curious, like, what you can you, you can, really learn about them? Well, just, just so everybody else <laughs> okay, is, gets um, the context of, of why you're This is probably a, I, I'm, I have a house in um, Gloucester, and it is right on the edge of what was a large mill complex. It's an 18th century house. Uh, the earliest date we know is 1815, but the whole structure reverts farther back. Um, it was converted into a tenement dwelling with additions, which of course are not going to need heated floor, correct, everything, a mess. Um, and it was res restored by someone who, with a highly inventive sense of what probably was correct, um, he had a kind of a good idea about pulling things back and enough to, to get the, taking the Victorian incrustations out of it. Um, so it's it's supposed to be plank. Um, no such thing as a straight angle anywhere. It's a mighty hole. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's really unique looking too. It's almost like a, a, a sawed off five bay. So it's, it's, it's only three bays. Yeah. And, and so the, the door is at the, the end of one. And so it's very, 
it, 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 it it's a very a, unique style. It is. So you, you think you're walking to the central chimney with the, the one hall or one parlor and you enter the hall and that's it. So it, it's, it's... I think they just built half and decided to keep going and build, and the family was involved in, in terms of town history, was involved in building infrastructure for industry. So they put their money elsewhere sure. and patched this in. But I mean, you know, there, there existed remains of um, stencil walls and I mean, it really was quite actually quite a nice house. Beautiful it's not, granite it's not a ruin, yeah. yeah. And the, the, the base floor was a blacksmith shop. So you sort of have this always related to what's going on. Which he wanted that very drafty for, so it could right. collect a lot of money. Right, yeah. right. right. Now stop. Still, right. still drafty. Yeah. So, yeah, so you have your own sort of. Yeah. So. Um, I live in a 45 square foot, three story Victorian um, in the historic north end of Woonsocket. And um, I'm just between a synagogue and a Catholic church. It's weird, but um, <laughs> cool. <laughs> told my mother she could stop praying for me. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you gotta come for almost. Come on in. But um, it was chair. updated with plastic siding in the eighties and railing. You know, Is that right? ugly railing. They took all the posts, porch posts out, all of that. So I really want to restore it. All the trim. It's been hidden behind the plastic siding. But my real problem here is the kitchen, yep. because it isn't built the way the rest of the house was. You care about the servants, right? Mm. So, um, yeah, another problem. well, it used to have a big stove. The chimney's out of the middle of the kitchen's been removed, but yep. that would have been what heat came that from. So, um, yeah. so it's freezing, and and of course the thing costs an absolute fortune to heat. It's got a boiler. It does have three zones. That's good. Um, but it's, you know, the water heating around the, and oil, it's costing me a fortune. So. Right, and it's a cheaper year, fortunately. I'm sorry, I, I found moving blankets. I've been tacking them up last night with nails, with layers and layers. Um, oh, I know, yours is all there. Uh, well, mine is the high ceilings, but at least there's some distance air in the wall cavity <laughs> that insulates a little bit. Right. <laughs> You don't have any of that. <laughs> so I, um, I don't personally own a historic home, but actually my uncle, my two uncles, and my aunt do. He's helped from Massachusetts. Um, I, I don't know a whole bunch about the history of the house. I believe it's over a hundred years old. It's been in my family for a long time. My grandfather bought it after we uh, got out of World War II. Um, so the house is very drafty. A lot of work's been going on it. My mother and our seven brothers and sisters have all grew up and gone through the house. My parents live about three miles from the house. Uh, first, I rent in Somerville, so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but what interested me about this workshop is actually my background's in mechanical engineering. Uh, yeah. I do controls work, uh, yeah. commercial, industrial controls. Um, a lot of work over in the Cambridge area. I work for a company called Snyder Electric. Oh, sure. Um, but on this side, I'm pretty interested in energy efficiency and Passive solar homes, I have a good amount of decent library, um, and so that kind of brought me here. So awesome. maybe I can give my uncle some tips. Yeah, I will. Sure, we will. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I live in a triple decker. Yeah. Uh, yay! Old mill house kind of stock. Um, it was restored like, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago, so they blew insulation in. And it's really not that drafty, just a little bit around the windows. Um, I'm here primarily because I love old houses and I just want to learn more about them. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't have a lot to say. No, nope. <laughs> nope. there's always always a way to improve. I know being you actually right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I live in a historic house and it's, um, it's it's sort of a small historic house and it has blown-in cellulose insulation and storm windows and storm door, but um, I do, I mean, I can pay the bills, but they are kind of high for in the summer, like I stuck the air conditioners in the windows, but I use them a lot, and uh, in the winter it's kind of drafty. So I would like to, if possible, make it more efficient, uh, yep. energy efficient. You could say, 
whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you live in the house. You live in the house. Hope you buy only those and all that good stuff. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm Dwayne. I, uh, I own a uh, restoration preservation company. Um, been known to Rob for quite some time. Went to the same uh, college. Ten years before me, or something like that. Yeah. Put your age up, Dick. I love the dick. I think he's not doing me. Every every professional in in, in the, this field uh, learns a lot from each other and constantly picking each other's brains. So I'm always calling Rob with some weird situations that I get into, with, um, you know, sourcing things and that sort of stuff. So um, that's why. I'm, so. So that's good. I mean, I, I, I think it's it's great that we actually have this this huge diversity of, uh, from your 18th century to even uh, mid 20th ish century. Um, you know, and and it, it's really interesting in, in in seeing that that the way that these buildings sort of were built over the time in the U.S. Um, and it honestly hasn't been until the past 10 years, maybe that we've really been interested in how a building breathes um, and then managing that airflow. Um, and there's still, to me, to my eyes, my opinion is that they're still trying to figure out water and moisture management. Um, I think honestly, you know, modern buildings aren't doing that as thoughtfully as they can. Um, but in a historic building or an existing building or a wood frame building, uh, we're, we're dealing with, um, buildings that were not built to be airtight. So how do we introduce that into a building, right? So um, so what I'm gonna walk through today is not only sort of the different types of houses um, that we've talked about, um, but sort of what our process is and sort of understanding that building. Um, and for us, um, the colors are, true because this beige wall is throwing everything off. Their house really is purple. Um, but it is that green. So that, that, oh, okay. that, that green is, is what it is. Um, so this particular house is built in Newport, um, in the Point District of, of Newport. And uh, the Point District actually now is, uh, uh, there's a lot of focus on the Point District for the fact that it's uh, um, elevation. Uh, they're getting high tides that are coming on the street in the Point District. Um, so when we were introduced to this building, um, you have the 1750s house on the left, and then in the back was a series of porches, uh, Victorian porches that were built, closed in, added, closed in, and they did that like three times. Um, so this happened to be a friend of mine, and so, um, and he still is a friend there, even after we did what we did. Uh, a lot. So we ended up finding, he wanted to redo his back L um, and put a kitchen in, his wife's a chef. Um, so we ended up uh, opening it up as, as we should to figure out what's going on underneath. Um, there were no footings. Um, there was uh, two by four rafters um, and it, it, it was so pieced together. I said that there's no way I'm gonna put a nice kitchen in here for you. Um, so we ended up tearing off the whole back and rebuilding it. Um, that driveway where that mini is, um, is about the size of the driveway and that's all we had to work with. So it was a fun site. So anyway, the point of it is, is that um, it's, it's a matter of understanding. Here we had a 1753 house that was modified in the 60s. They put siding, uh, you know, the, the clap or the shingles on the front. They replaced all the windows. Um, still a plank frame house. They built some two by fours and walls and plywood sheathing. It was really interesting. Uh, so this one was a real mess in terms of understanding it. And it was a real challenge. And unfortunately what happened in the end was to take off the back out. Um, so it's always important for us to, to really kind of understand it from the ground up, right? And um, some of these pictures that, that looks worse than it is, but it's a really close up of, of a joint. Um, so typically around here, uh, we have mainly brick and or field stone, right? We do have some cut stone uh, foundations um, out uh, towards, you know, depending on where you are, Gloucester ends up having a lot of cut stone. 
Um, they have a lot of cut stone as you go west towards Westport and the Cape. They have beautiful, a lot of granite out there. Um, but you're mostly looking at around here, at least, uh, a lot of brick and field stone. Um, each sort of uh, contribute their own concerns uh, when it comes to how the building breathes. Um, in this particular instance of, of the foundation on the bottom and why I have that picture of the mortar, um, that mortar on the, on the front side up here um, was a hard mortar, and then this was a soft mortar underneath. So what happened was is the whole interior of this foundation was melted um, because they put really hard on the outside. Um, something like this, uh, you know, you might have mortar, it could have been a dry stack foundation um, that somebody pointed later on. They could have uh, parched it later on. They could have, uh, you know, so you have to sort of look at the, the, what's going on with it because if we have issues of air infiltration because there's missing mortar, we have to figure out, okay, well now how are we going to deal with this? Um, so understanding what's going on with the foundation is like first and foremost for us. Um, and it does contribute later on the foundation in terms of uh, water infiltration um, and dampness, right? Um, if you're in and around Providence, a lot of us know that we have a lot of rising damp that comes in through our foundations. Um, and the crazy thing, and, and, and I sort of, that's why I love old buildings, um, there are times we'll go down into a basement and it's really damp down there and you'll see two feet up, um, you'll see all the brick turn into dust. I can put your finger in it. Um, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, some of your foundation was, was definitely like that. Other times, um, I go there and they're in perfect shape. And well, it's on the same street. What happens? You look down near the bottom and they put a course of slate in there. And that course of slate, because the grain of the, of the, the layers of the slate are horizontal, the moisture doesn't work its way through those brick as much. And it ends up hitting the slate and the moisture doesn't go keep going up. So there's a lot of things and tricks that you can kind of learn about the building and say, okay, well, you know, there was a spring running through this, you know, foundation and someone tried to plug it up and that just kind of ruined everything. So we need to let the water to come through. And we've done that before. And then we make a trench and we'll let it go through in the spring and then we'll let it go out the other side. Um, or you put a perimeter sump pump in that, that ends up collecting it. So you're sort of looking at what conditions have contributed to the building um, it's either its health um, or, or uh, some of the issues of mold and excessive moisture. Because down the line, we'll talk about it, but really when you're looking at a really damp basement, um, it eliminates a lot of options in terms of what you're going to do for insulation, if you even do it at all in the basement. Um, and we'll talk about that later on. But, um, so your foundations are really important. What's that? My basement's warm. <laughs> basement's warm. Well, that's 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 good, yeah. sort of, right? Um, and, and sometimes, uh, like in our, our case, my house is a 1908, um, which I didn't explain at the beginning, um, but my house is 1908, balloon frame house, fieldstone foundation, all of our mortar is crumbling. Um, and there is air coming through my foundation. Um, and then there's other parts, since it's that Queen Anne-ish period, there are other porches where the air comes through the ceiling and then it comes into my second floor and then it comes up through like a weird spot in the floor. Um, so for us, our, our, our issue is that we have to repoint our foundation in order to make our basement warm, which will make our first floor warm, right? So reducing that airflow. Um, it's not as easy as me putting spray foam in all the joints. Um, so anyway, the foundation is the first, first spot that we're gonna look. Uh, the next is uh, we want to really understand the frame. Um, Rhode Island and, and, and Massachusetts are, are really unique in the fact that, that we have a style of uh, timber framing um, that is, as far as I know, it kind of only went from New Hampshire to kind of, I don't even know, it went a little bit into Connecticut, the plank frame building, the vertical planks. Um, That's me. Yeah, vertical planks, right? And, um, you know, that this is a vertical plank wall here. This is a vertical plank wall, right? The idea of a vertical plank wall is this is your beam, this is your sill, this is your post, and then there are no studs in the wall. They just nail those planks right to the outside of the timber. 
and then they nail their siding right onto the plank, and then your lath and plaster is on top of the plank. So your wall mass is a plank, right? Um, so that's going to have a different air dynamic and airflow and moisture exchange and all the different um, issues that, that are, are with a wall being the, the heat transfer, moisture, um, direct water. Um, it's all going to be within a plank, right? Um, but when you have a, a stud frame, timber frame, you, get, you can have that space, right? And the challenge, though, with having a space like this is how do you insulate, right? Um, and because something like this is a lot harder to get to when you have braces and things like that that are going to be in your way. Sometimes they put horizontal nailers, they have girts, they have other things. So your options as to how you're going to insulate that building um, are limited. Um, also, when uh, we're looking at our frame, we look at sort of how the building was put together. The earlier the building is, um, the less likely it's going to have um, a paper on it, right? The, the rosin paper is one of the first ones. Tar paper came in by turn of the century, 1920, something like that. Um, and then this junk came in uh, around the 80s, um, which is sort of this, this paper um, that has like sort of a wax finish on it. And if you guys aren't familiar with this stuff, you know. um, this is, uh, this might actually even be a 60 pound film. Uh, but there's 15 and 30 are typical. And then this is rosin paper, um, which was uh, uh, very, very common in the 1850s on up. Um, so when we're looking at sort of that first period building, be it until the 1850s, we're dealing with uh, siding right on planks. So if you have original siding, more than likely you're not gonna have a paper on it. Um, and then what they did is they put a wood spline to manage water behind corner boards or behind windows. They put a piece of wood. And that bird, that piece goes vertically behind this piece of wood and behind the side. Um, when they get to the Victorian period, uh, they start putting on rosin paper. And then have your tar paper splines. Um, and then uh, when we get to the 20th century, um, we start seeing more tar paper. Um, but all of these papers are designed as a windbreak first. Um, and then later on, tar paper became a water and moisture barrier. And then now they have the Tyvek paper and peel and sticks. Um, well, actually, a lot of people don't even use Tyvek anymore. Now they have boards, you know, uh, uh, pieces of uh, plywood that have an integrated piece onto the surface. It's like, it's like so that looks sort of like a sips panel, but lighter. Not even sips. It's just, what is this stuff called? I mean, it's 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 a plywood that has a membrane on the outside. Zip, you talk about zip, zip walls. Yeah, zip, 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 zip. Yeah. Yeah. So w the idea of the zip the zip system is that it's got it's you don't put an additional paper on there. You nail the sheathing up, and then you put a uh, some type of uh, probably siliconized or some type of compound over the fasteners to prevent air. And then overall the seams, you seal up the seams so you don't get air through. So it essentially um, is mostly impenetrable, right? Uh, like the Tyvek and the, uh, you know, this paper isn't really impenetrable. I mean, moisture can work its way through here. Um, this is uh, oil, you know, impregnated, so, or oil based, so the air, water isn't really getting through this. Um, and this is a wax, based um, and the water will bead right on top of it, right? So the idea is that these emerge as methods to manage water and vapor, right? Um, so, but when we're talking about the first period, we're mostly dealing with wood as managing water, um, mortar as managing water. They didn't flash the chimney. They used to just pack the chimney with mortar onto the wood shingles and that's what shed the water off. Um, so we didn't really have metal early on. Um, and then later on, uh, we start getting into lead, they start getting into tin, they start getting into copper. Um, and then now we can get into you know, all sorts of metals. Um, so, but when we're studying the frame, we want to understand, okay, how is this place built? Is it built a, a, a uh, you know, we know until 1850, we're dealing with pretty much a, a uh, timber frame building. 
Um, so if someone, if we just see the date of the building, or if we start looking in the basement, we're going to see um, what kind of frame it's in there. Um, but then once we start getting to the 1850s, what they did is they changed the style of building. Instead of building post beam, post beam, post beam up a building and stacking those pieces on top of each other, they said, well, if we cut a piece a lot slimmer um, into a, a two inch piece, and then we have that piece extend 16 feet, we don't have to stop at a floor. We could just put it in so we have our plate go all the way up to the top plate. And then if we want to put a floor in the middle, we nail on a ledger right here. So what happens in 1850 to about 1920 or 30 is that you have a chase that goes floor to floor. And this is really important to know because we're dealing with then air and moisture that can come in in the basement, travel all the way up to the attic and then out. And that's really important to know that because it's gonna change the way the building breathes, right? So we have to know this before um, we even do our, set, our, our audit. But it wouldn't have been that way, like my first floor ceilings are 15 feet. Right, well, it's, you know, most balloon frames aren't, are, are, are built continuous. So they, they it can be. I mean, they, yes, there are okay. limitations. They, they may put in a plate and sort of have okay. the, uh, you know, sort of like the platform construction, which is the modern stuff, they can put the joists on top if you have a really tall floor. So that, that is possible. But a lot of times they still, um, I mean, I don't know, have you seen the break? I honestly haven't even considered the break in a balloon frame when it gets above 20 feet or so. With the truck blackers balloon frame all the way up. From plate to sit, to, from plate to plate? Yeah. Really? Okay. Dropping insulation going all the way to the basement. Yeah. Huh. So. From the attic, especially here, because not only do we have uh, water to get from place to place, we had a lot of rail, um, and then we also had a ton of trees. Um, so one of the very first things that were the first industries really created in the U.S. was was wood, um, and uh, lumber mills popped up in New York State as early as 1650. So it was a, a big commodity. And so they realized, you know, we start seeing in industrial areas like East Providence and Providence and, you know, um, and even as some on the Cape, you can get really, really early sawn frames. Uh, there's a 1723 house in East Providence, the Walker house that has a sawn frame. Um, it's really a lot earlier than you think because technically they had sawmills in the 1500s in Europe, um, but I read that, that the timber framers were burning them down because they didn't want their work taken away. So we could see a lot of sawn parts. So when they figured out that we can lighten this frame that we don't need, you know, we can then transport these in a much farther distance than cutting an eight by eight, eight, eight by 10, eight by 12, and then dragging it. Um, they figured out that if we cut them in smaller pieces, then we can bundle it and, and send them out. They also figured out as part of this is that they can machine and make all of their parts as they did in this period. Um, there was a separate carpenter joiner that made all your windows and doors in a shop and then brought them to site. Um, they started doing that a lot more by the time you got to the Victorian period. So almost your whole house was cut and made and then brought to site um, and, and assembled. Um, obviously they cut things to length and did things like that, but a lot of times even door casings and things like that would be cut to length. Um, especially when they start dealing with those square rosettes, like they, it was really easy to cut a square and butt in. Um, so all of this was, was really designed to, for the efficiency of building. Um, once we start going out west, obviously the balloon frame is all over the, you know, um, basically every building from Mississippi west is more balloon frame. Um, because it was really easy to build. So when we're dealing with a balloon frame building, we have to consider how we're going to seal this building, right? So we have to know what, how it's built. Um, then, um, let's see. So um, along with uh, sort of the wall construction is our roof type. Um, it is one of, you know, the roof is probably along with the basement, is probably the, the, the one space that we see it done 
wrong more often than right. Um, the way a roof is supposed to work in terms of uh, airflow is that you're supposed to allow your, your, your um, well, in the summertime, you want to have that stack effect, right, where all the air kind of comes out the roof. In the wintertime, you want to make sure that your heat stays below your roof. Um, you want your heat to stay inside here because you're not living up there, right? So that's a matter of controlling that air, um, but then making sure that up here is, it has a lot of airflow. Um, and that's usually the mistake, and we'll talk more about that later, but when you start choking out this roof, um, your house becomes more, uh, becomes less efficient. Um, and it actually contributes to ice damage. Um, what we see a lot in Providence, because we're dealing with the Victorian house, um, we see a lot of complex building assemblies where we have uh, intersecting roof planes, we have dormers, we have uh, knee walls, we have finished third floors, uh, we have slate roofs. Um, so all of this is sort of contributing to this real mess of function. And so it's a matter of understanding that function and how to best deal with it. So we want to know how the roof is put together because that's going to determine how we create airflow in that attic and if we create airflow in that attic. Something as simple as like, does it have uh, a ridge board, uh, which is right there? Because this one doesn't have a ridge board. Um, this one does. That ridge board can be a choke point, you know, and can be, you know, how people put those uh, 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 roof ridge vents up on the roof. Well, if, if you have a, a ridge board and they don't cut it far down enough, they just, <laughs> nothing's breathing. So you're not getting the square footage you need. And we'll talk again about what their actual formulas that are designed to say, well, you have this much square feet, you should have this much open air space in your attic. Um, there's been times that I've, especially in um, uh, older houses of the 18th century, I've said to people, you have to leave that window open all year round. You need air in that attic because you're getting ice damage. You need to make that attic cold, but you have to make sure the floor is insulated. Right, or else now your stack effect is like going over the, over the no top. No problem, really none. What's that? It's cold. It's cold. Really, really yeah. cold. Well, <laughs> but you don't have a, a your house is, health, house is uh, real healthy. Um, so when we're talking about all these parts, right, um, what, what are the goal of an exterior envelope of a building um, is to control water and moisture, right? Um, obviously there are temperature considerations, but really, how well a house manages moisture and water will determine its longevity. Um, the drier the house is, the longer it'll last. The more it breathes, the longer it'll last. Um, the one thing that, that I see kill most woodwork, especially historic woodwork, is caulk. Caulk kills it. Spray foam kills it too, but caulk kills it. Because a building like this, I've seen siding on a building of an 18th century building that is original. That, and, and it's not because that piece of wood was a unique piece of wood and it's going to last longer. It's because the house was breathing in a very balanced way. The front was breathing as much as the back was, so the back was never really wet and the front was never really, you know, they were never offset. So if your back is really wet and your front is really dry, it's going to cut and it's going to split and it's, the paint's going to peel. Um, if, uh, you know, you're not sort of allowing them to dry equally on the both sides, you're going to get that cup. Um, so a lot of that, how you're controlling that air, water, and moisture is going to determine how long all those parts last. Um, you know, there's this uh, product out there, uh, like never paint your house again. Right. Um, the Rhino Shield. Uh, it's bed liner, right? You ever see this stuff that's in the bed of a truck or even mm -hmm. for some reason been underneath your car? Um, they have this very rubberized finish that goes on top of things. Um, what that does is essentially put your whole house in a plastic bag um, or in a rubber bag. Um, so when the water gets behind it, it can't get out, right? So we're trying to manage that water and moisture and that all this paper is in, in systems of allowing the water to get out is the way a house stays dry and stays healthy. Um, because once we start putting in insulation in here, if we're not controlling water and moisture, this stuff is getting wet, 
And did you ever pick up a, 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 a cast iron pan with a wet towel? You burn yourself. So same thing happens, not the same thing, but what hap what's happening is you're getting more transfer. The water is allowing that heat or cold to transfer faster. So when you put in insulation in a wall where you're not controlling water and moisture, then that's getting wet and then it's transferring more cold or more hot. So you're almost better off having nothing, right? Um, so it's something that we want to make sure when we're doing our assessment that flashing is working well, that our splines, these are called splines here, um, that the splines are, are functioning, it's not over caulked. Um, you know, they're not caulking the bottoms of things. Um, so we're really looking at, uh, you know, actually paint is one of the biggest indicators of how healthy a building is. If you see, you know, paint really is supposed to fail in certain ways. Um, and when it starts failing in unique ways where you're seeing sometimes, you know, a large, well, the telltale is like you see a large bubble, looks like a big zit on a building, right? And sometimes we even pop those and water comes out, right? So now you've got sort of water behind your finish and that's not a good thing. So we're looking at the finish, the paint, to determine how it's peeling. If it's sheeting off in big pieces around a particular uh, uh, joint of where flashing is supposed to be, um, and we see it peeling really bad, it's telling us that there's water behind it because water and steam, like now my window shop uses steam to take paint off, right? So water will take paint off. Um, but if a building is really dry and it's cracked the paint and it's just falling off in little pieces, well, that's a good fail. I mean, that's the way it's supposed to fail. Um, and if it's alligator and all that like this, <laughs> you know, it, it's just too much paint, you know, but this isn't really, none of this is a moisture problem. This is just a paint failure problem. Um, we should rub paint there. Good demo. So <laughs> we're not here for lead. So, um, so the moisture and water management, we're controlling liquid water. We're using things like, like gutters. Uh, we're using drip edges. Um, we're using downspouts that are controlling where the water is going away from the building. Um, we're controlling the liquid water. Um, we're making sure things can breathe. Uh, so this, when they talk about ventilation here, um, you have to think about all the moisture you're creating in your building stays in your building. Um, until it either settles or is absorbed um, into various things, fabrics and things like that, or, or anything organic, papers, um, sometimes drywall. And then that excessive interior moisture um, is what can create mold, right, with, with, with temperature. You don't have to worry about that now, because <clears throat> it's too cold. But <laughs> you'll, actually, you'll actually know, because, because one of the, the, the restorations that was done in my house, I learned the hard way, house previous to this one where they covered the entire thing inside with, with clear plastic sheets and I walked in and it just started to choke so I got the house for very little but I had to really take everything off and remove all the interior plastic in the house I mean now unfortunately the papers he replaced it with clear sheets of plastic so I have the entire thing wrapped on some structure with this and I know it has to go because sometimes it's just hanging down in sections we didn't bother to check it off, so I have no idea where he put it, but it's everywhere. So and we met the owner uh, when we walked through the house, and I asked him, <laughs> I said, so, uh, let me reassemble this. Did you put plastic behind it, Charles? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was a very 80s thing. It was very, my, my back uh, um, pulled porch is, is plastic behind everything. But if you're controlling the moisture and you're controlling the water, it doesn't really become an issue, right? I mean, it's, but when it's, you have sort of that trapped mass, like let's say, you know, on your plank framed house, um, he doesn't have a good paper behind it. And then water is getting through the planks and then it's hitting the plastic. Or the sun is hitting this wall and is trying to get all that water out. So the sun is drawing some of it forward, but then some of it is condensing on the backside of that plastic, right? So plastic be, sometimes isn't our friend. Plastic is our friend when we put it on sort of a basement, uh, um, on a, a <coughs> the, the, the dirt in the basement. We put that down and then we put crushed stone on top of it and then 
concrete or no concrete. That's what the plastic is doing is it's stopping the, the evaporation of that water into the space. And you don't really care about, and there's really no mold that I've seen that grows between the dirt and the ground um, because you need air for that. So, um, so it's, 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 that's an appropriate place to put the plastic. Um, so you have to be mindful of the fact that, okay, my house is creating water. Um, how am I getting rid of it? Right. And today when they build a new house, they're doing sort of all the energy audit stuff. Um, and then, um, they're having to lap to mechanically get that water out. And that's where they have the air exchange. Right. Um, and Ken will talk about that a little bit. So we have to make sure that, um, that, that we're controlling the water that's in our house or the moisture that's in our house. Um, air leaks. Um, that's the whole point of all this, right? We want to control air and we want to control the air from the outside in. Right. So any way we can stop it on the outside, we do it, and then we start to stop it on the inside. Um, and but we're mindful of where we're doing that because there are consequences of trapping water, right? Um, but air is, is stopped in a whole variety of ways. Um, and then a moisture escape path. Uh, path. Um, the, the reason why I was saying I hate sort of these modern systems is because what they're doing is um, they're using the paper or the, the, the side or the sheathing as the water and moisture escape path. So in a building of this, you know, 18th, 19th century, we're using the surface as the water escape path. And then if it does get in, we're making sure, excuse me, we're making sure that things like these splines that are down here, um, that's a continuation of this. So when the water hits this, it goes down, 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 and then out. So there's a water escape path. Um, and the buildings that did this are the ones that are still around. <laughs> the buildings that didn't do this are the ones that you've had to replace your siding, um, especially for 100 plus year old siding. Um, so that, that moisture escape path or water escape path is really, really important. Um, so water management, um, like I was saying, it's gutters. Um, if you have gutters, they need to function. If you don't have them, then you need to make sure the water is controlled on the ground. Um, not having gutters isn't always a problem. <coughs> there was a long time that people didn't have gutters. Uh, you know, when we were first building houses here, that was the least of our concern. Um, and then they started just making a, a V gutter, you know, uh, the, the Yankee gutter, we call it. Um, and then they started getting more sophisticated and started milling um, wood gutters. Uh, they, some of them made them by hand, actually uh, Jefferson's place, um, Poplar Forest, uh, made all their gutters by hand. Um, but eventually they sort of, the Victorians sort of settled on sort of this profile. This is a modern version of it. Um, but essentially they, they would sort of put a wood gutter on. Um, this is not a proper assembly of it, but it, it's an assembly. Um, and uh, some of them, yeah, I, I just kind of whole thing on wooden gutters. But <laughs> um, the key though with water and, and gutters, especially aluminum ones, is this one actually isn't a, a very well designed because what happens is when this fills up, it goes in the back, right? So every gutter is supposed to be taller in the back than it is in the front. Every gutter. If your gutter's tilted like this, then it's filling up and going backwards, and that's a bad, bad, bad thing. Hey guys, Seven. so uh, set yeah. up on whatever door you find. <laughs> so it could be that one too, if you wanted. But if that one works, go for it. So, um, so gutters, right? So gutters, gutters, gutters are really, really, really important. So if you can't afford to fix anything else, fix your gutters first, and make sure the water is getting away from the building. Even if, let's say this is rotted, the wooden gutter, and you've got a hole and the water is not staying trapped up there and it's just kind of going in down to a spot and it's not causing a problem, it's not a big deal. I mean, the gutter's already rotted. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's not always a problem. Um, so controlling the water is, is really, really important. Um, uh, Providence especially, we have a lot of gutters and downspouts that go into the ground. Um, I actually encourage people to clean them if they can and use them again. Um, 
Legally, you're not supposed to be able to put it in new, but you can reuse what's already there legally. How do you know if the tile is okay in the ground? You can have it scoped or, or the rotor rooter They come in and they, I mean, even if, it's just, it's sometimes there are really impossible spots in these houses in Providence that you just can't drain it on the ground because it's going to create a problem somewhere else. So you've got to. That's what I have. They bypassed the French drain and let it go down the bulkhead. <laughs> so you just try to ream it out. They're not that expensive to get someone to rooter it. Okay. Um, and they'll know if they're going to hit a root. Like a lot of times they come up and they're like, oh, no, it's not going to work. Okay. Um, other times you, you're lucky and the thing works all the way through. Um, so direct water, um, this is the same house, right? So this uh, was shingles over clapboards, right? Um, and the shingles over the clapboards were leaking. That's the window right there. Um, and it created all this rot. And you see this little, that stuff right here? That's plastic, right? So when they were getting that direct water coming in, it was soaking this whole wall. There were two layers of siding on there, so that couldn't breathe. It couldn't breathe inward, so all the water stayed outside, right? So that is gonna, and then this was all insulated, and then all that insulation got there. So direct water is not our friend. Um, roofing, uh, slate roofs, asphalt roofs, wood roofs, um, Really, the, the the easiest part of roofing is roofing, and the <laughs> you know laying the tile, laying the, the, the asphalt, laying the shingle um, is is technically the easiest part of it. The hardest part of it is flashing, right? Uh, Ninety percent of the roofers out there now, especially the ones that are cheap, um, are going to use flashing in a tube, and they're going to squeeze it out. Right, and, and, and then that's gonna be your, your flashing. So um, really the best method for flashing is, uh, is a metal flashing, and that's what you wanna do. Um, so it's making sure that those are functioning and that you're not getting that trickle of water inside your wall, which is showing up through peeling and other things. Mine was originally copper, yep. um, but copper probably, and then it degraded, and then yep. somebody filled it with rubber. Right. Um, it would be, nice and pretty if it were copper again, but, but and it's also not your best metal, is it? It is. Oh, in, okay. in terms of uh, copper, a well done copper should give you 100 years. Wow, okay. 75, and the more hidden it is, the more it'll give you. Plus is 150, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I've seen copper that, and we have a couple finials back there um, that are from the 1880s, and, okay. and the finials just, they're, they're like paper now because they were fully exposed. Right. Other times, uh, we were working on a house that had terracotta on it, um, and some stuff under the terracotta where there wasn't uh, uh, debris uh, is was rotted, but other parts were as good as the day they put it in. This is the, the most rotted is the between two the valleys. lines. Yeah. Yep, the valleys. And, and that, that can be repaired. And if you have a slate roof, the best roof you can put on is a slate roof. Yeah. Yeah, metal is good too, but slate roofs are great. Um, you know, so it's, it's, but slate roofs breathe a lot, a lot. They breathe a lot. So you have to be sh careful of how, you know, almost as much as a wood roof. Um, but the, uh, a wood roof is different because it absorbs and it gets soaked and then it dries, it gets soaked and dries. So that's a different thing. But when you're dealing with slate, um, the slate aren't tight to each other. They're just sort of loosely laying on top of each other. So what um, you do underneath in the attic is critical. Well, they should have put this heavy paper underneath them. But a hundred year old roof, it's now powder um, because it's so hot. Uh, but slate, slate is its own monster. Um, actually, I mentioned before that that spray on uh, uh, rubberized paint, technically it was designed to work with metal. Oh. It's excellent with metal. It's not reversible, this but is, it's excellent This is with actually metal. just the rubber roof extended down into the gutter. That's typical. Ridiculous. Yeah, and, and what happens is <laughs> and ugly. this this is rubber here, and this is was wood, uh, and they, they, a lot of times they just they just yeah. lay right in there, and it's it's just a matter of time before we have to do something, and it becomes really complicated and expensive. Um, siding, I kind of went through the siding. Um, this is that same house here. 
uh, that was rotting before that I showed you. Um, this is the various layers. This is a brand new house. The flashing was done wrong. It had um, hardy board cement siding on it. You could barely see a little like efflorescence or fizzy in it. It's like a, a fizziness that was happening to the siding. And they're like, why is that happening in the siding? We opened it up, the whole wall, all the particle board um, and the studs were rotted. And this is a 20 year old house. Um, another house we worked on, the SIPS panels, structurally insulated panels. There was a leak around the window. Um, and we had to replace all of the SIPS panels on the whole house because they flashed the house wrong. And nothing worse than saying to a client, not only do we have to reside your house, we have to take everything off, which is drywall, walls, everything. Open it up like a dollhouse and put it back together. Nothing worse. Um, it's good conversations. Um, flashing. Um, all types of flashing. The flashings I don't like are the peeling sticks because they're really thin. Um, and uh, the, the brush on or out of a tube. Um, I like I like natural, you know, metal. I prefer metal. Um, I, I, I really I prefer it that that even like when we're dealing with old buildings, there's sometimes that you don't even need flashing because the way it's designed is brilliant. You know, the way, you know, let's say a mud board, you know, uh, at the bottom of a building um, just sort of has this little lip on it that the clapboards sit on top and it's just a beautifully designed system. No car, no flashing, nothing. It's a great system. So for us, we're trying to figure out, okay, is that flashing introducing water? And it becomes really important. Um, gutters we talked about, here's your rubber lined, mm -hmm. um, where rubber really is just uh, a bicycle tire repair. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that's another thing that anybody can do it out of the box, but not everybody can do it well. Um, I learned that the hard way. Hard way. Um, ice damming, and we're almost to these guys. Ice damming is a result of the warm air in your house melting the snow on your roof, it's melting, hitting the overhang. The overhang is freezing, it refreezes, and then it creeps back up and the ice grows and it goes back up and then it comes here and then this warm air hits it again and it drips. That's how ice damming is formed. If this was all cold, ice damming would never happen. So that's our goal, is to isolate the warm house from the cold roof, right? And, and we're gonna talk about that. Um, so we talked about moisture and dampness. Um, so now, <coughs> let me just see where I am here. Okay. So Ken's gonna talk about air movement, right? And, and, and what we're trying to do is to reduce the amount of movement going out of the house. I don't know, and, and Ken can attest to it, but um, I, I can't really, I don't think there was any house built before 1950 that's going to need an air exchange. Um, you can beg the differ. I don't know if you've run across one, but uh, you're getting a plenty of air exchange in an old building. Um, but what we want to do is we want to control it so we're not losing it through the roof and we're not gaining too much in our basement. We're not having that cold air flying into our basement and then pushing the air um, out of the house up top. We want to slow it down in the basement and then let the heat generate inside the house, stay in the house as long as it possibly can. That's the goal, right? So that's why we're gonna have an audit is to say, okay, well, how do we stop that air from coming, or not how do we stop it, how much air is coming in? And what are we gonna do to that air that comes into those spots? So then I can find out from these guys when they come in and do their testing, how much is coming in, where is it coming in? Um, and then we have to figure out, okay, is it a uh, foundation problem? Is it a wall problem? Is it a window problem? Is it a door problem? Um, everyone that's going to come, uh, if you say, if you call up uh, Pella and you say my house is drafting, they're not going to come and say you have to repoint your foundation, right? I should yeah, <laughs> <laughs> doors and windows. I mean, now, doors and windows contribute to thirty percent of all your heat loss in, in a house. I don't even know how they can pull that out of there but they, they pull it. Um, so it's a matter of then putting the signs behind these things so we're not relying on those that are claiming to be, well, not, we're not relying on people that are focused on one thing, right? So 
if you call up a guy that does blown in insulation, um, he's going to suggest you put in blown in insulation. Um, so you have to be uh, as neutral as possible in your fact gathering. Um, so then when you do get that recommendation, uh, you can go to the appropriate person, right? Uh, or appropriate specialty. Because, uh, you know, Ken's company isn't the one that's going to do ever, all the repairs that he's suggesting, right? I'm the, even not the one that's going to do all the repairs that we're suggesting. Um, so I think to us, it's really important for our analysis to stand alone. It's really, really important for it to stand alone. Um, because if it's, if it's, you know, sort of slanted towards all the things I do, um, then it seems very suspect. Uh, but I tell people at the very beginning, you will get a report from us that will give you an independent, you know, you don't have to hire me um, as, to, as to what's going to happen in your, you know, to what the best things to do in your house. Um, sometimes I, I get a little, you know, more concerned about um, who's going to do the work, um, especially if the building is um, teetering either towards uh, some bad things happening um, or it's a significant building or sensitive building. Um, in the sense of its, of its uh, well, for me, the, the sensitivity would be the purity of the building, um, and not even the historic nature of it. I mean, it, of course, it, you know, you're going to have curators walking around important buildings with you. Um, so, you know, they're, they're already going to know it's important. But I'll walk into some 18th century buildings and be like, this place is the peach. Like, I, I you know, it, we're not going to go crazy in this building. We're just going to make it better because this building is phenomenal. Um, so... Um, which, you know, people like to hear, <laughs> you know, and, and even like, like, you know, when you, like you, well, you know, there's, there's something very charming and unique, especially when you, when there's the history behind any, you know, you start telling me like there's, there was a, a, a blacksmith in the basement, you know, so like I start looking and everything like, wow, yeah, this is really cool. Like I, you know, I see what the blacksmith was using this space for and I can see what this window was for. And, you know, so you start end up really appreciating the building. Um, and not wanting to just blow it up and redo it um, for the for the sake of it, you know, everything is a little tired. You know, you start to look at it like, okay, well, you know, here is sort of all the issues we got going on here. So what do we do? These things are least invasive, reversible. Um, these things are more invasive and permanent. Um, so which one do we do? You know, some might be based on income or money. Uh, others might be based on, on how much damage we have to do. Um, so... Windows and doors, yes, they do contribute um, because they're the most active part of your house um, because they open and close. Uh, so, uh, but they're not impossible. Um, and sometimes um, it's really easy, sometimes. Turn our attention to these guys. And um, I have y'all introduce yourselves. Hi, these guys. Uh, we're these guys. So, Ken. All right, thanks folks for having me and uh, Rob for having us out. Uh, my name's Ken Twitchell, I own Ocean State Energy Audits and we've been in business uh, somewhere between 10 and 11 years. Uh, Rob's been kind of on board since the beginning of that. He's, he had started his own energy auditing business and then we kind of, uh, okay. yeah, <laughs> kind of merged forces. Isaac's with us today, he's an uh, uh, intern, I would, I would call him, I guess, uh, for, for a little bit of time here. Um, this is part of his senior uh, project. Senior project, project yeah. yeah. Awesome. Good for you. Yeah. So, what school? Uh, Branton Christian Academy. Oh, yeah? yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. I didn't realize they did out, out, out. That's great. Yeah. Out in the community. Are you related to anybody here? Or no, you just um, met these I'm guys? I'm best friends with his son. Okay, cool. Yeah. cool. Yeah. So he's nice. got it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. He's my uh, half son. So. There you go. There you go. Um, when we got into the business, uh, try to give you a quick history, um, I was actually. Uh, working with doing a lot of remodel work and um, uh, the powers that be, um, namely National Grid, kind of uh, had their, their finger on the pulse of energy auditing and there was a certain company that, that did all the auditing in Rhode Island. The Public Utility Commission said, you know, you guys are doing all the audits and you're also doing a majority of the work. That can't be, so we're going to break things up. So the state hurried to get a bunch of people certified to do uh, energy auditing work, thinking that that was going to open up uh, you know, this major opportunity for folks. And the, the company ended up administering the program and not doing work, so there was no work for any of these newly um, formed energy auditors, myself being one of them. So 
I decided to, to uh, push forward uh, with the business model of I'm going to do my own thing and attention to detail and, and work specifically with folks that um, you know wanted a more one-on-one -on -one relationship and not kind of the, the big picture so thank you uh, <laughs> fast forward um, I ended up uh, forming a relationship with another company and doing audits uh, alongside them, Rise, Rise Engineering. And um, at the same time, even before that, doing auditing work for the Weatherization Assistance Program, which is for low income and uh, elderly and that sort of uh, clientele. Um, so we got a lot of experience with that and different uh, people, <coughs> walks of life and all that business. And through that whole process, we also got um, our feet wet with new construction because current codes require uh, a lot of the same types of testing for uh, new builds in order for people to get their certificate of occupancy. So we're kind of all over the map when it comes to this, this testing, which I like. Uh, it keeps us on our toes for sure, but also um, you know, keeps the dialogue going and, and we get to see old and new and everything in between. Um, so tell me, so for those that don't know, the, the modern or the current energy code, uh, which Rhode Island adopted now, right, only in the past few years, Massachusetts adopted it uh, way before we all like Mass. But um, the, pro, the, the it's now its own book, right? There's, there's the International uh, Residential Building Code, it's about that thick. There's the uh, uh, commercial one that's a little thicker. And then there's like sort of the energy code, which is its own book. Um, and in that book, you're supposed to build from the ground up with certain uh, efficiency measures uh, that include not only sort of your appliances um, and uh, your mechanicals, uh, but it also includes the performance of the building. So the building has to meet certain thresholds at certain points of its construction. So I mean, you want to talk about that a little bit as to what phases you're involved with? Sure. So, so as you can imagine, like as, as time goes on, uh, electrical codes change, plumbing codes, and everyone kind of anticipates that. Those trades have been around for, for decades, if not centuries, right? Um, or a century. Energy code is, is still relatively new, and it was almost, it's, you know, kind of viewed as an optional thing. Like you can build a house if someone wants to go crazy and make it energy efficient, that's fine. Clearly the dialogue has changed and energy efficiency is, is on everyone's mind. Um, but, but there's been pushback from, from builders and, and associations and that sort of thing, because it does add uh, new layers of uh, red tape and bureaucracy and all this stuff. And that's, that's what they are against because it just makes it harder for them to build a house. Uh, at the same time, from my perspective, like why, why would you, if you're building a house, not take these extra measures to make it more comfortable, uh, more healthy, and clearly energy efficient, and, and give that to the, to the customer. Um, so during the build process, when, when you're gonna go get your, your certificate of occupancy, you have to pass certain milestones. Um, we have a lot of builders that don't do anything and then expect they're gonna pass these milestones at the end and it's too little too late because like Rob said, it starts at the, it starts at the ground. Um, so we work with hundreds of contractors and some of them care, some of them don't and we have the conversation daily. Like you need, you need to start this from the foundation. You can't, you can't call us at the end and then wonder why you're not hitting the numbers. So, you know, believe it or not, a, a foundation, um, you know, in a perfect world would be insulated uh, with rigid foam or, or something else um, as, as the foundation's happening and before it gets backfilled. And that's step one. And then putting the sill plate on and making sure the sill plate is sealed and not just, uh, not just weather tight, but also airtight uh, is, is step two. And it, and it just goes on and on and on all the way till you get to the roof and then the finishes inside. Uh, so much of what we preach is air sealing and stopping air infiltration so that at the end of the day, uh, as a homeowner, you can control uh, air exchange in the house uh, by means of mechanical ventilation <clears throat> instead of letting Mother Nature um, dictate how much air is moving in and out of the house. That's, that's so much of what we do. Uh, insulation layers and, and our values and all that is, is another big part of it. Um, but from where we stand, uh, air movement is the big one because that's, 
that's the most costly uh, inefficiency that there is, um, you know, depending on how, how good or bad the house is. So it, it almost outstrips uh, other factors that, that you're considering. So when people talk about like replacement window companies, they're gonna talk about how uh, the U value, right, which is a thermal transfer uh, measurement, um, how, the, how great the U value is in the replacement window. Um, or, or how great the, the R value is, either one. Um, so they're talking about how slowly the, the temperature will change as it goes through the mass of their, of their material. Um, so, uh, but even a, a, a traditional assembly of two panes of glass uh, or a storm window and a primary window um, can reduce that thermal transfer. But honestly, windows stink. You know, I can have a one inch thick piece of wood that will have less thermal transfer than a pane of two panes of glass. So, you know, I, I, it's, it's the type of thing that, that you have to control the air or else you're really not controlling anything, you know? And, and, and when they replace their window units, you know, they're not thinking of, of the seal where that unit goes in, right? They're just testing it in the shop and showing that the center of the glass is, is that much. So um, it's just a, it's a matter of sort of being aware of where, you know, the, 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 the best um, bang for the buck can sure. be. Replacing windows not the top choice, really. The windows are usually the, uh, one of the least uh, mm -hmm. uh, down the list um, for air transfer. Um, right. But that's what we do. We and another big transfer. part of that is, is uh, in, in order to, for these <clears throat> programs to work, they look at what the, what the return on investment is. So uh, windows are historically expensive and, and get more and more so as, as time goes on, the better windows, and, and then also uh, whether the town or the state mandates a certain type of window depending on where you're at. So, uh, you know, rule of thumb is that a window is gonna take, uh, well, it's kind of pretty big, but 15 to 25 years to pay itself back in energy efficiency, uh, where other measures are under a year. Like if you air seal spots in your house, uh -huh. it pays back immediately because the air is not transferring. So, you know, we have to look at it through the lens of what's the what's the priority here, and 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 work it that way to to satisfy programs. Um, but to your point, if someone's sitting in their on their couch and they're next to their beautiful window and it's got a lot of things going on <clears throat> and they feel a draft. The first thing they're going to say is, my windows are leaky. I, I need new windows. Um, the installation is is so important, and to understand that, you kind of have to get into the um, the bones of the house and understand how it was built. Because uh, you know we've got new windows that, if, if they're not installed properly, it's not really the window that's malfunctioning; it's the installation. So if that's not weather stripped and and done right, and then the cavity. Although there shouldn't in new construction be much of a cavity, uh, if that's not filled with some kind of a, a low expanding foam, um, you're going to feel a draft, and you're going to be like, "Wow, I just bought these windows, and they're not, and they're not functioning properly." And it's it's not the window itself. Um, clearly, older windows have their own uh, set of um, <laughs> idiosyncrasies and things that you have to deal with. And, and Rob's company does a great job at addressing those issues and working with the customer and, and what their uh, needs and wants are. And can we do work from the inside? Can we do work from the outside? Um, we can, you know, do the best we can with the windows to maintain the historical integrity of the house, all that stuff. And, and that's, that's huge because, you know, from where we come in, it's like, I want to get in your basement and air seal. I don't want to mess with your windows. <laughs> it's that's like, I want to save you money immediately. I want to change a light bulb out because you have this incandescent bulb that's, you know, 200 times more, you know, energy efficient than, than a new bulb. And, and bulbs have come, you know, night and day. Um, so you can buy, you know, you know, really pretty bulbs that, that look um, quaint, um, but they're LEDs and they, and they still give off that warmth. <laughs> so this is a very 80s room right now. Uh, we have, we have the, the, the most, the highest consumption, hottest uh, halogen window, or halogen uh, bulb there. And then these are all fluorescents, each 40 watt, each bulb, and each one has four bulbs in each. Um, so, yeah, probably that too. So now you can see only one strip of light because I disconnected all the other three because it was just ridiculous. Um, 
But yeah, so it, it's looking at those low hanging fruit and actually rise doesn't look at windows. When they come to do an audit of the house, they're not really looking at, they don't, right? I mean, unless the window is- It's, it's, uh, it's kind of glazed over uh, and they basically will look at, <laughs> no <laughs> point uh, They will look at the age of the window. They definitely put it into the program. Um, so if it's a, you know, double glaze or, or single or, you know, casement, whatever. So there's like some background stuff that happens in the, in the program and just kind of spits out a boilerplate um, you should consider replacing your windows. And pretty much, I think it's just an age thing, um, knowing that there are more efficient options out there. But okay. they don't get involved, they used to, but they don't get involved in changing out windows. Um, at the very most, I would say that there may be some rebates that you could get uh, if you purchase windows and have them installed and you could you know, go through some paperwork and then maybe, the, maybe you can get something back from the federal government. So, uh, and, and uh so with new new construction, I mean, obviously, this the, what you do in new construction is different than what you're going to do in an existing mm -hmm. place. We'll just call it existing. You won't say just yeah. old. Right. Um, so uh, how you will approach, uh, what's your approach to a new building or an, uh, an existing building as opposed to a new one? Like, what do you guys do when you're, you're showing up? Like, what, and, and let's say yeah. we're not involved. Yeah, uh, yeah. so an so, energy audit. Um, So we're, we, we get a certification in order to do the work that we do. And, and the building, yeah, building Performance Institute, I mentioned before. Um, that basically the mantra is do no harm. So the idea is um, we're, we're there to look at energy efficiency and what options are there to make the house more efficient, more comfortable, save money, all those things. But we always have to be paying attention to what um, the house is <coughs> whole and how anything that we do, how it affects other things. So if by some miracle we came in and air sealed up an existing home that was really leaky and we got it really tight, then all of a sudden your moisture in the house is not gonna be able to escape. Um, we look at things like your heating plant. So if you have an uh, oil fired boiler in the basement and for whatever reason, you know, it's, it's got a tendency maybe to backdraft through the fault of the boiler or, or maybe some kind of weird air exchange that's happening in your house, if we tighten up your house, that makes that problem worse. So, so we have to look at every single system and, and look at it as, okay, if I do this, how does that affect everything else? Um, and that's why we have the tools that we have. So uh, the blower door is, it, it can tell us so much and it's such a useful tool. Um, so, new construction versus existing construction. Um, new construction is, is very kind of rudimentary and simple where it's like, we're gonna run a blower door and we're gonna make sure that your air exchange doesn't <coughs> get over a certain amount um, or your house is gonna be deemed inefficient. If it's below a certain amount, it's gonna be considered probably too tight and the code does call out for mechanical ventilation to address that. What that's do you, kind what of do you mean by air exchange? Air exchange, so so air that's in the house that's able to exchange uh, to outside the house by itself with, without. Um, Is it? And what's the threshold for that? Um, so we're in Rhode Island, so it's uh, <laughs> you, you know you could probably tell the billing official what you think the threshold should be, and he'd probably be like, okay, <laughs> like not everyone really understands. Well, when it. when do you need mechanical? Like, at what point? So do that's you need a, that's actually still a good question, but oh, really? the way that the the code reads. Um, you do have to put mechanical ventilation in despite what the blower door number is going to be and then you would set the rate of exchange on that based on what the blower door reading would be and uh, whatever other factors. So, you know, pretty much if, if your house and so we're going to measure it in air changes per hour at a certain pressure, which is 50 pascals, that's the pressure we put the house under when we do our test. So it's ACH 50. So the number before that is, is what we're looking at. So uh, five is kind of a number that's, that's thrown around a lot as far as, yeah, you might want to address um, making sure that you have mechanical ventilation in the house. In order to get a certificate of occupancy in Massachusetts, it has to be three ACH 50 or less. If you're building wow. in Canada, it's got to be a 1.5 or less. Wow. Connecticut, three. Florida, seven. Rhode Island seven. <laughs> really? wow. Yeah, that's that's and that they just went, happened in January. It was eight last year. They went down one. Oh, yeah. Oh. So we're making gains. It's the only thing that's going down in Rhode Island. <laughs> uh, 
So, so we don't um, have a big radon problem up here or anything like that. That's really an interesting point. And and it's, it's funny, we just we're dealing uh, <laughs> We're also yeah. her as raiders, so we we we're involved with the, uh, new construction uh -huh. projects. What's hers? Hers is the uh, uh, what is it, the whole, whole energy, energy rating. rating system. It's uh, developed by ResNet, the national company ResNet. It's uh -huh. a big thing. Um, it's it's really tough to get certified. It's uh, the the testing is mind blowing, but you gotta you gotta go through all this stuff. So anyway, we are both Ken and I are both her as raiders, and we're both BPI certified. So. We, we do new construction quite a bit now. We're involved with a bit of a lot of different projects. Uh, we work with uh, Clear Result. Uh, you probably heard of Clear Result. They're our provider for that program. Um, and we also do things on our own. So if you had a house you were building up, uh, we'd, we'd take the plans, I'd, I'd bring them home, I'd make a three-dimensional model. We'd model everything that the house is going, all the walls, with what they abut to, whether it's uh, the ambient air, whether it's a basement, whether it's a garage. Um, and we define all this stuff, but we take a look at the U factors and a couple of different factors of the windows, uh, the orientation of the house, the where the windows are, any overhangs that affect the windows, all that stuff goes in. We, we work from the slab right up, we, we design it with, uh, as the builder builds it with the insulation on the exterior, maybe in the, on the perimeter, on the slab, all the way up. All right, so they, I'll, I'll, what the wood, you know, what, what the construction is made out of, two by six is typical here, so we're not 21, would be a typical wall, all the way up to the ceiling. Uh, and then we get into air sealing, and we, we use the blower door to, to, to generate how much the air exchange is. And there are times that uh, with, with certain houses, uh, the, the, the passive house, specifically, mm -hmm. um, they, you know, to give you a scale, uh, I had a friend that, that built one of them, and uh, he had the equivalent air loss in his house to about this big. Wow. So that place was tight, 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 tight. Um, Sounds like an electrical outlet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he showed me his phone. To be certified as a passive house, your blower door reading has to come in at a 0.7 AC. Wow. So, so it's really tight. With him, you know, that, I mean, their house is ridiculous. They, they have double walls, exterior walls. They have... Uh, a series of rock wool and ridge and, and fiberglass. Um, they have, you know, so there's no thermal transfer. He's got triple glazed windows. These ones that you turn the handle different ways and it mm. does different things. Um, <laughs> you ever seen those? Like open and closes, you mean? <laughs> well, yeah. No, you turn the handle. You turn the handle this way, it'll open up on a, as a side hinge. All right. Or if you turn it the other way, it'll pivot yeah, from the European top. European brand. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy. Um, so, uh, but their house, and they have solar on the roof and things like that. Um, their house, if they had the heat off, and a day like today, um, it would have to be this cold for like three days for the temperature to go down in the house. Um, he, his air conditioner had to be half of the smallest unit you could buy. Right, so if you, what is it? That's one of the benefits of getting a tight house, is that the tonnage for the for your AC can be less. Yeah, it right. was so like 5,000 BTU as a small unit. He needed like 2,500 BTU right. in order to cool the house. Um, okay, none of us have that. Uh, no, <laughs> no, but it, 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 just to, to let you know where these guys can get it, right? I mean, this is, it's, it's really cool to kind of see the science going behind sort of all the thermal bridging between all the, the, the different ways that dynamic of the house will function. But you also have to make sure, like in terms of sunlight exposure and things, that you're not, you know, if you had way too many windows on your south side and your heating, your cooling load is off balance, then that, where all that sun's coming through is going to get really hot and, and it, people are going to be frustrated that they're in a house that still is really hot. Um, so that balancing is really important and I think it sounds like that's where you guys kind of come right. in a little bit. You're the new, the new stuff is different from the old stuff. Um, I've only seen a picture of your house, the Victorian. Yeah. So typically we'll be looking at your house, typical air leakage places are up, up in the attic area where the knee walls are and stuff like well, that. Well that was, are, my question was can your testing find surprises? I'll give you an example. Yes. The kitchen ceiling was lowered mm -hmm. sometime in the 80s, about two feet. So when I tore it out, turns out all these new replacement windows, those with the lowered ceiling were put in smaller, but the original case opening right. still was there. still there, no insulation, <laughs> big old space. Um, you know, if I hadn't ripped, covered with wallboard, everything, you know, if I hadn't ripped that out, 
we're able to do uh, uh, it's called pressure differentials in house. So you could so yeah we could we could just put a little probe and we know what the pressure is. They were running this at 50 pascals and put a little probe into different areas and if, where there's a big pressure difference we know that there's something going outside because this whole this whole area here is at a constant pressure yeah. and and this area here may not be you know this could be into the into the foil into the breezeway going in between that could be more connected to the garage or the outside than it is to the inside yeah. and we can we can test things like that Another really cool thing we can do too is while you run the blower door test, assuming there's some kind of a temperature difference from inside to outside, is a thermal camera. You can you can learn a lot. You can you can see um, you can actually see kind of like air movement happening uh, while the fan's running. Um, so you'll see cold streaking on walls or, or under doors and that sort of thing. Well, baseball, uh, baseball. Like my stairway is like a chimney. It pulls all the heat yeah. up to the. So you just see all these temperature differences that you you normally wouldn't see with the naked eye. You know, living in a house, you'll be like, well, yeah, there's definitely some uncomfortableness here, but you can't really see it. Yeah. A thermal camera like is like a different animal. It's like you just see this whole world of hot and cold, um, and you can see a lot of things. Yeah, house pressures run different. Okay, so the, a house has a uh, it, it it has a natural pressure up. Right. So everything tries to get in down here, and it try by the time you get to halfway through your pressure, you probably notice it when you walk in your house. All the pressure it wants to get out at that point is is a break. And, and the a, kitchen then wasn't even quite the effect. same as the rest of the house. It has a shallower basement. Mm. It's it's the, it's pretty much the temperature of the outside. It's the only room that's cold. <laughs> So it's like, what is going on? There's right. a breeze coming from the ceiling. That's what we investigate when we're there. Typically, we talk to the homeowner, and you, you come up with that concern. So that's something we would, uh, you know, we look into. A so little then bit you more come intent. with recommendations for the fix. Yes. Correct. So we would, and you know, like I said before, usually we'll try and prioritize it. Um, in your case, kitchen. you know, <laughs> kitchen. Like that's that's my focus. So like we're able to. Um, step outside of like a boilerplate type of uh, analysis and say, okay, let's just address the kitchen area. <laughs> so when you're looking at that, uh, just so you know, and, and certainly pass around, hang on to it as long as you like. Um, the center where that little bullseye is, is the relative temperature, the relative, it creates the relative color to everything else. So, and where that center is, is you're seeing a temperature. That's what the temperature is of that object in that center. Right, so when we're looking at it, we're, we're looking at relatives. So sometimes, you know, uh, from 60 to 40 degrees, the 40 degrees will be blue, you know. Um, but a lot of times we're dealing with like, you know, 70 to 20, you know. Um, on a day like this, we literally can see like underneath the baseboard of a house, you'll see it like solid blue, you know, with, and, and then you put, you put a smoke test next to it and then you see the air kind of coming through. Um, or you look and you can sometimes see the studs in a Victorian, you know, and then the insulate, and then where they forgot insulation. Um, so it's 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 Victorian. one of the like I can walk in and, and do my you know on a day like this if it, if you had a twenty mile an hour wind I can almost yeah. somewhat do the equivalent of the the the, the simple blower door test. Um, but I think that the one thing that's really important is that even though I'm walking through with this and even though I have a smokestick. Um, it doesn't mean that I have the expertise that these guys do, right? So that's why it's important for me to say, you know, for people that really want to understand what's going on with their building, um, and typically for me to help with with these guys, um, the blower door typically is a couple hundred bucks um, without <coughs> us. Um, and with us, it can be, you know, four or $500. And, and what that does though, is it gives you that boilerplate. And it says, okay, here are all the things that are happening with your building. Um, so. That's right. So my assumption here, and then this is completely self-centered, because most questions seem to be, um, when you're dealing with houses like ours, um, my interest is in, in a combination of using what you do to take an 18th century building and shift it towards a more forward-looking dwelling. I mean, it can't continue to do what it does more than 25 more years. I mean, it, becomes completely inefficient to run, impossible to live in easily, you know, dependent on fossil fuels in a way that's absurd. So, so are you, do you have clients who are looking to use your services to, at one point, try to convert their buildings to more energy efficient 
you know how, how extreme does it get for you? Yeah, how does it go? For, for <laughs> us? Because I'm kind of almost if we're just past a tent category. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to create a bubble so in the house. Kind of that we're still going to your horsehair plaster yeah. is your insulation. I think you for us, we, we haven't yeah. gone to, to probably to that extreme. Uh -huh. There's certain limitations for sure, um, depending on what style of home you have and, and what is available. Sure. That being said, um, I know there was a program um, through National Grid and it was very select and they called it a deep energy retrofit. And it was to the point where they would take siding off the house and basically build the house out with rigid foam and then reside the house. And they'd have to extension jam all the windows and doors and all that business. Um, and at that point, you know, you're, um, you're taking over the whole envelope. So you stop air leakage, you're insulating, you're making it really way efficient, more than any other existing home, um, to the point where you can, you can change out your heating to, you know, you could do mini splits and have an electric heat and have it be efficient. So there are definitely programs like that. Mm -hmm. um, typically, it's, it's, there's so much money involved um, and people, you know, it's, it, it takes over your life. You know, 90% of people are just like, I'm gonna move. This is not my headache anymore. I'm gonna sell it and let someone else deal with it. Well, so, like I called the siding guy. He would not do just the back wall. You know, he's like, oh no, I have to do the whole, you know, the whole house. I'm yeah. like, right now, but only you're the up one against wall a needs lot. some insulation. Business is booming, and it's a find. Uh, contractors, like they, they pick and choose. So they're not going to go in, inside one side of a house when they might have a builder that says, I've got five houses that I need cider right away. It's, it's unfortunate, and unless you have these relationships that you've had over the years with, with contractors, like I hear it from everybody. It's just so plumbers, electricians, like you just can't get them out for small jobs. And it's compound that with uh, the lead laws. Um, and there's a lot of contractors that just won't touch anything with lead. Uh, and the closer you get to your neighbor, then even less people are gonna wanna work on it. You know, so, it, 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 and then there are those that, that aren't really interested in, in sort of crafting something back together. It's not as straightforward. Yes. For them. Yeah, re restorate. Whenever you say restoration, nobody wants to do it. So well, yeah, they, except you guys. <laughs> there are a lot of there are a lot of assemblers, meaning that they know how to put a new window in a new jam, and how to nail the flange off and tape it and flat, you know, with all the modern stuff. But you say, hey, take this old Victorian window and replace a couple of casings on it and do a little epoxy in the corner. You know, you're you're kind of throwing a curve that that they're just not practiced in. Right. So. You called that deep retrofit? Deep energy retrofit. Sounds like a Trump thing. And I can't, <laughs> yeah. uh, um, I can't promise you that, that that's even still a program that they're running right now. I know they were a few years ago. They're, they're really pushing the, I get emails from them all the time. They're really pushing the energy efficiency. So we're. Yeah, who's, so who's, we, who's that right? No, National Grid. Yeah, oh, no, they have to. The public, cheap light bulbs and. The Public Utility Commission forces them to do it. Yeah. Um, but I do believe, uh, and, and my attitude has changed towards that, that they that they do care um, and they do want um, these things for people. If they, they need to change with the times as well. And, and you know, Gina Raimondo saying that, uh, that all electricity by 2030 is gonna be renewable energy, whether it's purchased or, or we produce it ourselves. And, and those are the major kinds of, of conversations that are going on that really drive drive this conversation. And and uh, they say that energy efficiency is the cheapest uh, energy. So take care of, of making something efficient before you you know actually start using more electricity, gas, oil, whatever. Uh, so, it's the cheapest energy. It's there, and you're just not using it. So. So you mentioned oil, gas. What do you recommend? Natural gas or oil? Electricity. <laughs> electricity. <laughs> Everything's shifting for, to electricity. <laughs> there, there are heat pump systems. Yeah. There are communities in California, oil there are some station. in Mass, that but are still, not allowing people to run gas lines to the new homes. Right. They're Every going only electric. And that's, that is oh. the reality. Um, that's that, you know, we're in Rhode Island, so maybe, you know, Gina's being like super aggressive, which is cool. I feel, but you know, we could still be a hundred years from that. I don't know, but but that's where everything's going. It's just going to happen. There's there's countries that are doing it now, 
and and it just makes sense. It's not for us though. Incredibly easy in California. It, it, I mean, if they just put if they put solar panels on their government buildings alone in California, they can literally run, they can literally run it. Yeah. So they've mandated that that all new residential construction is going to be net zero by 2025. Right. So they're producing as much as they're as they're using. And that's 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 happening. The tough the tough thing for us it, with a with an old building is that your your demand is too high for just a heat pump alone, um, and and so and and to get it where you can use sort of just electric is is tough. So it, it, it's a matter. I mean, because even things like I, I haven't read the Green New Deal and things like that, but what they were talking about mainly was deep that deep retrofit of existing existing buildings to reduce the amount of consumption. Um, so you're almost like it, it would change like right now when we do the the remodel code uh, or, or the, the um, code rel relative to rehab versus a new build they give us a lot of leeway sometimes not a lot Massachusetts is worse like if you put uh, if, if you put an addition on an 18th century building depending on the inspector and I ran across it that that you can't put in an original window system like a single glazed plus a storm window by code you're not allowed to even though there are 40 of them in the building and you're just adding two so it, it, it depending on where all of this goes is sort of our concern as preservationists is like okay well how do you maintain that old building but yet how do we make it more efficient in a smart way and that's where these guys come in right and they say okay well this is really how you're going to benefit from this particular retrofit um, and they've, you know, we've we've had some interesting conversations about performance of certain buildings. There was one that one up in uh, was it Smithfield that one house that that we ended up um, with the center chimney. Yeah, 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 and you know that one we couldn't do a lot, but what we did really improved the building. Um, you know, we couldn't insulate the walls. We can barely insulate any of the attic, uh, but we ended up insulating around the chimney stack uh, because it was a volume of air coming it's a from chimney. there. <laughs> well, the heat well, was going out. It was crazy. It was working. Oh, Massachusetts actually just changed that law. Oh, did they? In uh, whatever you can get, you have to have an R3. Oh, that's not bad. Um, we can almost prove that. Right. How they can <laughs> prove that. I don't know how build, a regular old town building inspector could prove that. I don't know. But yeah. they said R3, R3 is, is what you have to have for any window. That's pretty good. So, I, I, I like that. That's better. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, it, you know, there, and then on that, also that building, we ended up seeing a lot of air coming from baseboards. We literally got this backer rod foamy stuff. I'll grab a sample of it. Um, and we stuffed everything. Um, we uh, air sealed a door going to an attic You're space. You're lucky you just had air. We had squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> but in the end, I think we made... Squirrels have to breathe. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't do a, a, a ton to this building, but we improved, I think, the air exchange by like 20% or more. I think we did even a little better than that. Mm. Um, so, you know, and that wasn't a lot of inform in, 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 um, but it was stupid things. Like she didn't have dampers in her chimneys, well, I don't have dampers. you know, and, and that, that between that and, and some of the doors and the sill, the perimeter sill, uh, where it touched the foundation, um, and the, around that chimney, just those things that we did improved it by like that 25%. Um, so that's, that's huge. Now, again, if someone went in there now and tested that building, they were like, this building is terrible, not knowing that we improved it 25%. Um, so it's, it's an interesting dialogue as to how to deal with some of these buildings because they're not as, I mean, you guys can attest, like there's some assemblies in these buildings that there's air flying through, but there's almost no way aside from tearing the whole thing apart to yeah. deal with it. Right. You know, so you're ending up saying, okay, well, how do I make sure that I'm not, you know, that I'm just going to let the air through and, and, and make sure that it's not causing more problems, not ice damming or whatever. And there um, are, you know, there are grants out there and, and like the Department of Energy is, is uh, they offer up money for our people to, to go and, and say, okay, how, how am I going to, almost like a deep energy retrofit, but how can I take a building? Because they, they don't want to see all the housing stock that's out there just get steamrolled over and we're going to build new from now on. Like there are, not everyone is of that mindset. So it's like, okay, what are we gonna do with our additional or existing housing stock and, but make it efficient, like, like new homes. Um, so there's, there are groups out there that are trying to figure that out. And, and it's, uh, it 
it's, uh, you know, it's, it takes time to, to make it so that it's affordable. Um, you know, it's one thing to, to, to rehab a house and, and do that and make it affordable housing. And, you know, when there's money available from the government, it's another thing to have it enter mainstream commercialism and be like, you know, how is anyone going to make money? Uh, that's, that's what it all boils down to. Right. So, you know, as a contractor, you're not going to touch a project like that unless the government's helping you out. You know, we were actually part of a program through National Grid through Rise. They hired us to do a, a hundred home study on existing stock. So we went in and did a blow door test, and then we Ken and I went and we air sealed in the attic in the basement, every place we could do, and then we followed up with a with a blow door test, and all that stuff went into their uh, their master type of thing for that year. It's probably three four years ago now. Probably. Yeah, right. And yeah, it's a pilot program, and is, is it like that data available? I'm sure it is. Yeah, I'd um, be interested to see just the we, average, the, you know, just the, the, you know, how it made a difference. It made a difference. You know, there's no doubt. Um, for whatever reason, they, you know, who know who knows whatever Where it went and what. Well, it, it I know I said I read the report when it was done, and, and they basically said that it wasn't, um, it didn't make sense. So. I disagree with what their findings were. Um, the, it depends the, on what they're looking at. The too. biggest drawback was that um, getting going back a few steps, like we go into a house and before we run a blower door test, we, we do a, a, an inspection of the house. If you've got asbestos in the house or we did the um, combustion analysis and if you fail any part of the combustion analysis, which is, is, is testing your boiler for high levels of carbon monoxide or backdrafting or not enough um, draft, all those things we test for. If you fail that, then then no air sealing work was going to happen in the house until it got rectified. So we would show up with these people that were on board because they were getting free air sealing potentially. So we're, we're showing up and we're like, okay, we're definitely going to be in your house for an hour and a half, but we might be here for eight hours. And that's like, you know, you just can't do that to people. Um, and that was part of the problem of that program. Most people we could do, especially if the house was built after, and well, not even, because you never know if something's gonna fail. So, you know, we, we were able to do most homes that we thought we could, but every once in a while you hit land would be like, oh, high level of CO, you gotta get a, you know, your HVAC guy out here, whoever, and maybe we can come back another time. Um, so that kind of uncertainty doesn't fly well with people. Really. We wear carbon monoxide detectors when, you know, we wear them through the house. We do a reading on the, on the combustion stuff to see how much is there. And then and then we put the house in what's called worst case conditions where we turn on all the AC and, and all the vents and the bathroom and the kitchen and all that stuff. And then we see if there's anything backdrafting down into the house. Because it's, it's pretty thin. You may have something dead up in the up in the chase there or something that's- Just throw these around. You, know, uh, you probably do. It's like <laughs> a personal personal carbon monoxide detector that um, we wear on us to, to measure levels in the house. This is the we're on the National Register, so my insurance makes me have them. They have to be 24 hour monitor. Right, yeah. It depends on what they look like. Um, that actually uh, will let us know if there's like a gas leak in the house. Yeah, it's certainly but these are things that you- like that, you could easily buy it. Not yeah, that you would. Air we we do it because we have to walk around the house. That, stuff, that one, I don't, I don't, you can I test your gas know. pipes yeah. to see if there's a leak. <laughs> it's it's just just so those you have to buy for the right. certain okay. chemical you're monitoring for, right? Um, so you're just looking for. That's only uh, natural, natural gas. Natural gas. Yeah. And then that guy right there is what we use at the furnace or the boiler, okay. and that tests for carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. Um, yeah, all, all sorts of things. The efficiency of how the fuel is burning, um, oil, gas, it doesn't matter. You can actually test wood to see how efficiently it's burning. Um, so those are some of the tools that we use to, uh, you know, I read something the other day, and you you may know this because you burn wood, don't you? Um, Amongst other things. No, I'm kidding. No, uh, yes, I burn wood. Like if you see smoke, then it's then it's burning inefficiently. Like you shouldn't, you shouldn't really? see any smoke oh, when you're burning wood. I was wondering wood. about that. Like, <laughs> I read that the other day. What all the steam chimney? that's coming up? Sorry. Yeah. Steam. When yeah. You, no, when you moisture. see smoke, like uh, some of the houses on my street have smoke coming out of the chimney, but others don't. Like, why is that? Yeah. So it's yeah. usually yes. just uh, uh, condensation. Uh, some houses have the cold smoke air, right? coming out Natural of their gas, chimneys, propane. and others uh, don't. It's the wood. Turn this thing on. It's it's either moisture in the wood or or other things that are going on. But the idea is, um, it was an interesting article, but basically you, you really want these uh, the embers and the coals 
um, to be what's supplying the heat and and the wood itself. Uh, if it's not the right kind of wood, um, it's, it's so inefficient the way that it burns, and it's just like all that all that uh, energy is is going out of the house or not. I think my house would have been heated with little coal oh. things in yeah, the fire. Stuff, yes. I, I think these houses are heated by oil or gas that have. Okay, so yeah. oil is it's typical to see that kind of, um, and, and it really just boils down to inefficiency. You know, gas gas really shouldn't have that much. Um, but if anything, oil will. But if it's really tuned in, even that you shouldn't see. Like a car, you know, and, and and it's the same. It's almost the same adjustments. Um, exactly. But you have to. It's that's why they how much air is is being used to combust and. There's a, there's a lot to it. Um, that's not stuff that we really get into. We, we can tell you if it's if it's efficient or not, but not necessarily why. <laughs> yeah, that it, you know that's a whole another thing. Is to uh, a lot of a lot of folks that put in a, a, a heating system, um, they just sort of plug it into something that was always there. You know, so they just used the flu that was there. Yes. You know, 110 years ago. So you know, sometimes those flus are unlined, meaning that they don't have a piece of terracotta going all the way up. Um, you know, and, and they, they themselves can create some inefficiency um, and potential danger. So that's why it's good for yeah. them to do their testing, um, you know, because you're not really even supposed to smell it. You know, like every once in a while, you're like, I remember when I was a kid, like a, our boiler would <laughs> cough, you know. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> the movie, a Christmas um, story. Christmas story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, so, but it's amazing now, like, but the way they can make a lot of these new systems work, um, you know, there were years ago that 150,000 BTU system was, you know, a boiler. Well, years ago, they were like this big. Um, but now, literally, it, it fits on the wall. You know, you can have a 150,000 BTU boiler that's mounted on the wall. Um, so the efficiency of these are pretty fantastic. And so that, even something like that, that test alone, and because and, when we have these guys come in, we have them do a blower door test and usually the systems test. Um, they've actually even done uh, duct, duct testing for us in this one new condo, um, which was a real interesting study. Made, it made me never want to study an 80s house again. Um, but You've been there, done that. Yeah, it just was everything about it. Like, it just was a mess. Um, but that the systems is one of the, the, the bigger impacts you can make. Um, I mean, it's a big investment, um, but they do have uh, you know, some incentive programs, especially if you're switching from oil to gas. Um, they have incentive programs uh, for boilers. Who's they? Uh, National Grid. Okay. Um, if it's a street fed system, oh. right? Because they're giving you the incentive because you're going to buy their gas. Right. So. Um, but, but a lot of these systems now are, are way, way more efficient, um, you know, um, depending on the type of system you have. It's a high efficiency system, so it doesn't, uh, all your, your, your combustion doesn't go through the roof. You know, right. you know it's, it's, it's in PVC pipe that right. goes in and, and, and the one. air comes yeah. in. So you're not taking any of the air for any, any of the combustion from the house. It's all come from, comes from the outside. So that with the, with the new high efficiency systems, that whole, uh, uh, carbon monoxide and stuff is pretty much mute uh, yeah. because that's a whole nother issue that, that they didn't talk about but sometimes if your air exchange in the house gets so low especially in your basement like uh, people shut the do they, they make a, 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 a furnace room and they shut the door yeah. right and that actually makes yeah, your boiler right. less efficient right you need you need starting yeah. so anyway um what else what besides else? that and well so just to, to that point and then your way earlier comment about radon. So that's all things that we pay attention to with the air tightness of the house. And, and it, it's a reality that, and it's, it's little looked at in existing homes. New homes, a lot of places will test for it. Um, but radon's like, like also a real deal. And last I knew, it was the number one cause of lung cancer over cigarette smoking. So Neat. that's Sorry. crazy. <laughs> and we don't test for it currently, but we're in the process of, of being able to do that. Because if we're going into a house and we're measuring how tight the house is or making it tighter, then it's like, okay, like that's probably a test that should be done if the house is relatively tight. Uh, because I don't, I, don't want to, I don't want that on my conscience, you know what I mean? And if it's, if it's a strong possibility that it's there, uh, it should be tested for. 
whether it's us testing for it or someone and else. And in 80s houses, there's formaldehyde in the building materials and all those things yeah. you seal in Indoor air quality. you tighten it up, you yep. really kind of screw things up. And that's all definitely going to be, be uh, talked about way more as, as things get tighter and tighter. And as a... Off gassing a, of, of uh, carpeting, couches, like you name it. Everything's got paints. something going on. Paint. Now or, yeah. We, uh, in our house that, that Mara and I used to have, um, we uh, tighten up the basement. We reparge the the walls, um, and then we uh, put on storm windows on all our basement windows. Um, so after we moved in, it, we made this basement really tight. It was nice, um, but when we left, when we moved out, uh, we had a radon problem, and we didn't know about it because when we moved in, there wasn't a radon problem. Uh huh. Um, it was breathing. Because it was breathing. Mm -hmm. So and unfortunately, it was Mara's studio for a lot of years. So you're okay so far. So far. So all this stuff is great, but my head is like spinning and mm -hmm. thinking money pit. How do we go from knowing where we're inefficient to being able to afford? Let's go. Let Let's do the show them the blower door twist test yeah. first, and because I do want to go into all of the measures, obviously, um, to 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 assist. But I think knowing. <laughs> the way the tests are done and understanding that dynamic of the building um, will help us. Have that conversation? That. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, and there's not going to be, a, like, you can see what's going on here. We're not going to perform an actual test because we're inside a building, inside a building. So, yeah, uh, normally, get up and check it out. Uh, this would get set up uh, in, in one of the most open doorways in the house, typically the front door. And um, there's a hose that goes uh, outside, which measures the outside pressure. And then uh, we set up the manometer to depressurize the inside of the house uh, to a certain level, normally 50 pascals. So if there's some kind of a pressure difference outside, the manometer will tell the fan to either speed up or slow down so that it maintains that pressure difference. And once it's maintaining that pressure difference from inside to outside, we take a reading of how much air is going through the fan. And basically that's saying, okay, uh, you have this much leakage in your house. And then formulas can be done to say, uh, you have a hole this big in your house, that all added up together or you have a hole this big in your house, which is more likely the case in, in some of the older homes. Uh, we encountered homes where we can't get the house to pressure because they're that leaky. And that's... Um, Sounds like your house. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a reality, <laughs> and, but it's, uh, it's kind of like, whoa, like it's eye-opening because um, you know, we're in new homes all the time. And you know, this, this guy has stiffer rings on it. Um, so like you can pop off this ring and that's a small one. At most new homes, we could get away with just testing with that ring um, and pressurizing a house pretty quick. But then it goes all the way to this guy, and you know, th there's there are times when uh, you know we'll be asked to do commercial projects or, or something industrial. Uh, we'll have multiple fans set up, and you know, once in a while we'll hit an old house where one fan is just not enough. And that's we did we did a brand new gymnasium <coughs> in uh, South Kingstown. South and oh, then we used one fan or two fans? We used two. We, we used set two. up the three. We used two we fans. Need, we were able we to depressurize three. it, no problem. It was massive. It was a, it was a yeah. basketball court and yeah. um, yeah. just like a lot going on. And we were like, that's cool. They measure it differently. They measure the amount of leakage by uh, square uh, surface area um, to the exterior walls versus the volume inside a residential house. Um, we run into houses that are way more leaky than that gymnasium. Like, it's just insane. So, that's cool. it is that's cool. Enough. Very cool. We were like so happy to be on that project. And yeah. uh, it came out really so cool. That was good. Right. So, what we do is we measure, we measure this, the house, we take measure for the square footage and the volume. And that's how the, that's what goes into <clears> this thing <throat> to give us that air exchange rate. So, obviously, we're not, we're not going into a ranch house that's not going to get set up the same as a exactly. Victorian. Okay. So, that's, th those numbers have to be plugged in. Okay. Um, I could turn it on for you yeah, and give you an try. idea yeah. how, how much noise it makes. It really doesn't make a lot of a lot of noise. Yeah. Maybe set it to the oh, it's not gonna turn. Maybe set it to like 15 <laughs> Pascal or something. I'm just gonna turn it on a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> All my ceiling tiles are gonna be <laughs> 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 we jump up and down the ground. Yeah, yeah. So like Ken was saying, the, the hose outside measures the outside pressure. So there's a different pressure outside and there's a different pressure inside. So this understands the pressure outside and it's relative to what it's reading on the inside. This is a manometer. This is 
This measures pressure, is what this thing does. So the uh, the calculator in here will take that outside pressure, the inside pressure, and even it off, so that we're starting at a at a uh, uniform base. And then the whole industry that we work in, this thing is ranked up to 50 pascals, and that's the that's the uh, industry um, um, limit on that. Commercial units are a little bit different. Uh, there's 75 pascals, and there's different. Uh, and as you know, in the building codes, there's different. Uh, criteria at different levels for different things. Residential, 50 pascals. Um, and this is pretty much it. Yeah, you have a whole house fan in the attic. So if I had this thing written and, and, I, and I plugged it in with the information it needed, it would be reading the amount of uh, air that's, that's, that's <coughs> coming out. Okay. So to pass a house in Rhode Island right now, you've got to be at least a seven or below. And again, in Massachusetts, five. Three. Three, sorry, yeah. Three, three. The program we work with a lot in, in Rhode Island because National Grid really understands that Rhode Island's codes aren't up to par. So they, uh, the program that we work uh, in, it's called the, the Rhode Island New Construction P uh, Code uh, Program, uh, that limit is a five. So you have to be below a five to get into this program uh, and, and to get into any of the benefits. And the Rhode Island New Construction Program is also a uh, what we do is all free. National Grid pays for the whole thing. So it's, it's a pretty big cost saving. And if you've got an HVAC system, like uh, Rob was mentioned before, we, we test <coughs> out the leakage that's, uh, that's going out of the system. So we can, uh, we can plug it in, we can find out how much of your heat is actually being distributed into the house, and then we can do, with the blower door and the HVAC system contraptions, we can measure the amount that's going outside the house. So if your furnace is up in the, uh, the attic, we can, we can tell pretty easily how much air is being leaked out of that as opposed to the rest of the house. It's, it's pretty neat stuff. If I call National Grid, they would send you up for free? No, you have, that program that we're talking about is, a, <coughs> uh, is, the, um, is the new construction program. But oh, you, can have a, you can have an energy audit by, by RISE that doesn't cost you any money. Right. I have had it. Mm. But then I didn't follow the recommendations because yeah. I was not sure about some of them. Some, some of part. them had, uh, <laughs> like I had to have my knob and an electrician come oh, in yeah, and yeah. deal with the knob and tube first, and I do have asbestos, so I kind of got stopped. Yeah, those are the carcinogen stuff. We they, they frowned upon us. If we knew there was asbestos in the house, we couldn't run this thing. You know, we can't uh, take the, you know, uh, the onus of taking the stuff and sticking it into the air. So we can't even run the blow door. So even like blowing in, if it's a, uh, you know, the vermiculite, which was a, uh, what were they doing, the 40s, 50s, yeah. 60s, um, it's, a, uh, it's a mineral that they would grind up and blow it into attics mostly. Mm -hmm. And then they, some walls, it's always fun. It's a really dry material, mm -hmm. um, uh, but it has... Uh, I laugh, but uh, half of the stuff out there has asbestos in it. So if you have it in your attic, no, I don't have that. That's I have they don't asbestos in the basement. Yeah. Not in the, attic. the knob and tubing becomes a fire hazard if you were to go in there and stick on some cellulose on it. So you can't. It, it you're heats not up. It actually attic. needs the airspace in the correct house to stay cool. Yeah, it's a tough it's a tough situation. I, I have that same thing going on uh, with. I have a rental property to the point where I'm, I'm going to have the knob and tube remediated, um, which, you know, it's a big project, but at the end of the day, you know, it's, it, I think it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And the program now will uh, give up to $10,000 uh, loan at 0% interest for seven years oh, to yeah, remediate yeah, the knob and tube. Right. Oh, man. That's right. I know, Matt. <laughs> yeah, it's worth it. I mean, you know, that it's not that it's free money, but if you're going to spend it, at least you can spread it out and, and have it not hurt so much. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's, there's really not a lot wrong with knob and tube, except you can't insulate the walls. And um, over the years, if the ends get brittle, so you have more exposed wire than you should, that's that's it's not good. The cloth. But at the you know, it's still you know, the houses they, they they're going they're going strong. You it's know, it's actually and, better than the wire used in the '80s, which uh -huh. right. yeah. yeah. So you know, it's got 
there's drawbacks for sure, and then insul you know insulation. Uh, uh, insurance companies don't like it because clearly there have been fires in the past, so they, they if they see it, they'll give you a hard time. Um, so it's really the right thing to do to try and remediate it, and, and then you know you can insulate, and uh, makes there, a big difference. You know there there's. I think again, it's it's sort of uh, my frustration with Rise is that I, I even though they they're trying to do the right thing, I feel like sometimes they're blind to the building. So, I might, so when yeah. I'm thinking, I might have a fire hazard already because in the '80s, Rise blew. You know, I had cellulose blown in. Mm -hmm. So, but I had not knob and two. Say not the wiring is there. So yeah, so it would be you know even then they were looking for it or they should have been looking for it. So um, <clears throat> my recommendation would be at least maybe have an electrician come in and say okay, you know if this wall is insulated, is there an active knob and tube in it? Normally they'll they'll try and look for that and say you can insulate this wall because there's no evidence of knob and tube. They usually have they usually require you to have an electrician sign off on it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that was a long time ago, so I don't know what the rules were then, but now it's like you have to have a licensed electrician sign off. So it might be worth having someone come out and just taking a peek um, in case in case there is a wall that's insulated uh, that has that wiring in it. And, you know, and RISE limits themselves just based on the programs and, and the retrofits they do in, in terms of the products they use and the methods they use just to, to, to create some continuity with approach, right? So they're not, they're not gonna come in and say, okay, we'll, we'll stuff this stuff where there's cracks. You know, um, they're gonna use either an expanding foam or, or something like that. So kind of the point, the reason why I wanted to have this kind of talk was is to say that when you're sort of in an unconventional home that requires sort of these unique approaches, Sometimes it sort of takes that that eye that's a little different than than your standard approach, and that's the so to say you know um, you weren't able to do you know um, you, you felt paralyzed because of what they were saying you couldn't do. There could be a lot that can be done outside of just those. Right. Yeah. So like. You know, okay, you, you don't want to insulate the walls because you have knob and tubing. Well, what else can you do? Like, what is okay to do that's going to help your building perform better outside of the knob and dealing with the knob and tube and the insulation? So, is there some air sealing you can do in the basement? Um, is there, um, be it by repointing or or by foam or by backer rod or what whatever it might be? Um, and then to say, okay, well, when down the line somebody does the knob and tubing, then I can insulate. Um, instead of saying, well, I, I can't do anything unless I do it all, um, which I think is plenty of times that we do steps with people, you know. And, and even you, you, that you guys, I'm sure, run across the same thing with a lot of retrofits. People are like, well, I can't do all this. Correct. Yeah. And you know, what do you so do that first? That gets to my cross question, Dan. How do you prioritize? Do you guys help with that? Or? Yes. What? You know, for us, again, it's, bang for the buck kind of thing? it's like, I, I feel air sealing is like, you know, as a homeowner, if you're active in your, in your, in the process, you can go to Home Depot and get, you know, 12 cans of spray foam for whatever, 80 bucks or whatever it is, and have such an impact uh, at very little cost in your home versus, you know, a lot of the other, other type things. Um, you know, that's kind of always where, where we uh, lean. Uh, because we see it every day and it's it's uh, it's amazing you know the numbers change and and that just translates to your air that you've paid to condition staying in your home versus uh, just you know allowed to, to escape the house so but sometimes you need this in order to determine where saying, it's I coming from as with anything there's like your, your usual suspects and it's the sill and it's the attic but this fan you know could alert you to like oh there's this huge cavity over your kitchen ceiling where there's there's like air you know what i mean like this this is a tool that really can help pinpoint um things that are out of the out of the norm um, so it is kind of a cool uh, way to approach it so in, and the point like with when you're dealing with an older building um based on those those construction methods we were talking about um there are times where, well, air is looking for the path of least resistance, right? 
So a lot of times um, folks will come in and say, well, your pulleys, your air is coming from your pulleys, so you've got to seal these, these cavities. Um, or you've got to remove your windows in order to, to prevent this path of least resistance. Um, my, my concern though is that the air is in the cavity. And why is the air in the cavity? Because unless you're just going to seal that up and the air moves to the appropriate spot out of the house, in a, in a controlled way, which usually isn't. Um, now you're just moving that air to somewhere else, right? Or trapping and, it there. Or trapping it there. And, and, it. You know, so what we start to look at is, okay, well, you know, when Ken looks at the windows, he's, he's doing everything fully locked. Um, he's making sure all the storm windows are shut as they can be. Um, and then when he turns on that fan, he's determining, okay, well, is it coming through some of these, you know, is it coming through here? Is it coming through here? Is it coming through here? You know, and all those three spots are going to tell you a different thing. Sometimes we see it coming from the casing, you know. Um, sometimes we see it from the outlet below the window. Um, and I saw that once in a house where in the basement there was a hole in the foundation for the, uh, the new heating system that was put in. Um, and they didn't air seal around that pipe. So it was a balloon frame house. The air went into the wall cavity up to the second floor came out the outlet right underneath it, right next to his bed. So the homeowner was like, we've got to deal with this window because the window's freezing, wow. right? But it wasn't the window. Um, so when I look at sort of those cavities that are bringing air through, I'm like, okay, it's not this fault. It's not the fault of this part. It's the fault of this assembly. So where in this assembly have we failed? And is that failure at the foundation or is the failure, which a lot of times, say every time but a lot of times it's this casing um, that the casing is rotated and the casing has come loose so it's come off of let's see it's off a little bit here it's come off of its jam and then when it comes off its jam right right here is when that air gets through there right and the air gets through there so your storm window isn't really going to help because it's coming through here and into this cavity when you replace the window it's not going to help because the air is still getting in there in that cavity so sometimes it could be as simple as refastening that to the building. Um, and if you have to, you have to recalk it um, appropriately. Um, so it's, it's definitely something when we're looking at all of this is that we're trying to determine where that air is coming from. If we need to blame it on the sash, then we do something with the sash. Um, but if it's sometimes it's not just that simple. Uh, you know, because what we're doing with the storm window is that the storm window's goal is to make this glass efficient, right? And make part of the assembly and these tracks efficient um, in terms of the air coming around all of these gaps. Um, so I'm trying to trap air inside here, right? But I'm not really stopping it all around the frame and nor are replacement windows. So that's why we're looking at, okay, well, how can we tighten up the exterior of the building? Um, and what's the best way to air seal it? Sometimes we can do it from the interior, um, as we did on this one plank frame building. We actually, you know, sometimes it's literally caulking around your trim, making your interior paint job as tight as possible. Hmm. You know, so then at least you're stopping the air from coming into the interior, you're stopping it in the wall cavity. Um, so there's, you know, there's lots of ways to sort of, um, sort of identify where, where the air is. But I can't do any of that without this. I, I, it's all guesswork. You know, I can look at the, the storm window and say, oh, well, your, your storm window um, is loose. I can bounce it and say, oh, your seals on your storm window are shot. You need a new storm window. Um, I can walk around my house and say that. Um, but my house, my basement was a, it has holes in the foundation. So I can do all, everything I want with my storm windows, but it's not going to make a difference. You know, because my, my basement's freezing. So, fix it. <laughs> yeah, I, was I say. hope so. <laughs> That's the last one to get fixed, right? Well, it, 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 it's, it's outside of my expertise. I got to repoint it. You know, it's like, I don't want to repoint my foundation. It's like, there's no worse thing than repointing my foundation. I showed you how on this old house. <laughs> I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> but my problem is, I know how. And, you know. Just don't want But don't you have to get the right kind of. Mortar and you need, well, typically you need to. My house is a, is a granite um, fieldstone foundation. So it almost you can almost use almost any mortar. Because your mortar, you don't want your mortar to be harder than the object or the, the building 
material. Um, and granite's one of the hardest ones. So typically, you know, not that you want to use a hydraulic high compression one or pure Portland. Um, but when you're dealing with a lot of these bricks, especially the soft bricks, you should use a mortar that you can't get easily. So how do you find a person that will repoint the bricks that does it with the right mortar? Um, ask them how they, you know, and it, it, unfortunately you have to, yeah, I have to ask them. You know, I, I, I don't know. And you, you wouldn't even know <laughs> that they're going to do it. They give you a story like the problem, the, and really know. I mean, you have to know the material. You have to know the brick. And, and to say, okay, this is a soft brick versus this is a hard brick. So that's the start of it. If it's a harder brick, there were a lot of harder bricks made based on the clay and how well it was fired and all that. Um, you can use an out of the bag, out of the box mortar, right? Um, there's a, it's a type N, that's the softer one. The type N is like the softest brick mortar out there and it's a pre-mixed but the problem was with the type N is it has a really wide compressive strength variable. Um, and the higher the compressive strength, the less it breathes. So if you use a, if for some reason that mix is a harder mix, it can mess up your brick and then your brick starts to fall apart. Um, so I recommend researching your problem yourself so that you know whether the they're asteroid. telling you the truth or not. Yep. Then the second thing is I watch my neighborhood for trucks, you know, people yeah. working around. Yep. Um, and then the third thing is Providence Preservation yep. has a list of Great list. recommended restoration people. Are so, you having an issue with your with the Brick Foundation? Well, I'm thinking from the stock that I probably that's probably where some of the um, I, I air is getting who, in is um, the foundation. Does chimney work, and he he builds chimneys. But like he, he can drive by a house, I don't know if I told you about him, but he can drive by a house and look at a chimney and tell you where the bricks were made. Like That's he's cool. that good. Wow. And wow. Uh, he's, he's like a quirky, super nice guy. I like his name. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll give it to you. I gotta look it up. I'm okay. sure. No, like, I'm kidding. Yeah. 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 comes down from Maine. Is it Lions? No. No. Oh, okay. Um, uh, Knox, basically. Okay. Um, Knox, I swear. Yeah. Um, so it's something, I, and I think you're right. It's it's the quizzing of, and you're almost not telling them what to do. You're almost asking, somewhat knowing the answer, but you're asking them to see if they're going to give you an answer that seems right, right? And 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 I do that a lot to my subs, and and, and I do it to learn, but I'm also doing it with some knowledge to say, you know, well, what kind of mortar would you use for this? You know, and they'd be like, well, you know, I I you know, if they say, well, I'm a little concerned that it's a little too soft. Exactly what I want to hear, you know. Um, or if they're going to say, yeah, you know, you can type in or even a typo will be fine, you know, which is the harder stuff. I'm going to know that this guy has no clue. Um, in Rhode Island, if you said the uh, Mason use lime mortar, 95% of them will not know what you need. They're going to think they're going to think the stuff you put in your garden, you know, um, okay, which isn't the depot. same. Right, yeah, right. they don't sell it at the right. end. Um, <laughs> but, but, but isn't that what you really should be using? A lime mortar, I've, I, I've had the benefit of using that. A traditional like lime putty sure. mortar. It is the greatest mortar I've ever used. Like it sticks real well, it's self-healing. Like I don't know why anyone would use anything else. Um, but it's harder. But you didn't mix it up so they got the it's just, it's just not as convenient. It's not as convenient. I mean, you know, they're, they're taking apart cathedrals right. in, in that from the medieval period where the mortar is still wet in the center of the stone, right. you know, and, and it's a remarkable but, product. You know, it's just, I mean, in my particular thing, just talking about this is as weird as I know that the top, the top sections of my chimneys were rebuilt. Yes. But I also know that somewhere in the midsection where I can't see is the old stuff. And I have no idea how that was joined. And who did what, and what's the weight, and what's the tr how did this transition, and are we dealing with a problem as we go lower? Right. Well, the, anything yeah. within the walls is not exposed to the elements necessarily. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. but you you learn. I mean, sorry, you, you learn. Like we had someone that they rebuilt a chimney on top of. They used old peanut brick, which is a smaller brick, and it's not fired as well, but. 
They use that, that some peanut brick. Um, they use that on top of a concrete block mass. So from, you know, here in the attic, out through the roof, they use an old brick. <laughs> it's a weird dynamic. Um, but what happened was, is that older brick, when it gets wet, when it, when, it's, when it rains, it gets wet, it gets saturated. And its saturation is what prevents it from leaking, right? Because then it just, that saturation just moves down the mass and then it goes through all the mortar and then it slowly dries out, you know, and it happens back and forth all over time. Well, what was happening, it, it was after we replaced the flashing and everything on this thing because it was leaking. What was happening is the, it, it was all absorbing, sucking in all that moisture. It would hit that concrete, the moisture, and then it wouldn't keep absorbing. It would stop, and then the, it would turn the water, and then it would go out the chimney. So it seemed like the chimney was leaking from flashing. But it was that absorption. And, and so it's really important to know like that, that masonry has its own dynamic in the sense that it has its own absorption rate, its own transfer. So it's something that, that um, you know, you, you do have to be sensitive with sometimes. There are some shales and things you have to be careful with what kind of mortar you use. Most of the granites we see are pretty tolerant, you know, especially some of the field stones. Um, but you, you go into an abasement sometimes and we see that even the granite is turning to dust not just the brick and everything else. Yeah, that's mine. And that's, and that's telling us there's a, there's a lot of moisture in that basement. Um, and we just bought on, on Amazon um, these tiny little, uh, what do they call them, hygrometer? Is that, is that what it is? To yeah. test the, uh, the, the, the relative humidity. Um, and they're really cheap. They're a couple bucks. Um, and you basically just put it on there and you just see. If you see like your basement is spiking to like 70% relative humidity, then you got to bring that down. Um, and that helps prevent the dying of your masonry. So, but that's that's all part of that study of the building, right? There's there there are signs for these guys that they're looking at. Like if they see a really wet basement, it's going to change the way they're presenting the solution. You know, I mean, I don't know how you guys. What would happen if you had a really wet basement? And like, would you? What would you say to them? Um, usually, we try and find the source of the moisture and yeah. and figure out how to deal with that first. Right. Again, tightening up a house isn't going to help that situation. It's going to make it worse. So the priority shifts to um, the indoor air quality and making sure that that um, that's right before we make things tighter or, or better insulated. So, you know, it is science and it is, again, it's it's do no harm. Uh, health and safety is, is the first and most important thing. Um, so clearly if there's moisture down there, mold could be right around the corner. Um, so that's something that we uh, take pretty seriously and, and uh, we would try and source, you know, or find the source of what, what's going on there and maybe make recommendations or maybe Sorry. defer to someone that knows moisture management better than we might, you know. So this is a perfect segue. <clears throat> so <clears throat> you mentioned that sometimes um, you're paying more attention to radon now, which is really great. Um, I always worry about, we live in a very industrial state, a state that has a long manufacturing history. Mm -hmm. um, and there are things like vapor intrusion that people wouldn't be aware of um, that are related to old, um, non-existent anymore polluting sources and whatnot. And I worry about yeah. people sealing off, like, you know, making their houses like airtight and impermeable and being subject to growing amounts of vapors that are pollutants. Mm -hmm. So do you test for that as well when you do this? Not specifically, uh, especially in an, in an older home. Um, it's so hard to get to a level where there's not enough air exchange uh, naturally. Um, but if that is the case and we're doing our blower door test, we've, we've done calculations on the house to know what the, the appropriate amount of air exchange is. If for some reason you got below that, then the recommendation would be um, some kind of uh, ventilation that uh, filters air and um, you know a lot of times it'll monitor um, s simple things like humidity and, and that sort of thing and obviously you got carbon dioxide detectors we should have in the house um, but it really gets to that point where it's it's that crazy tight you know um, but well, at, at the same time to have an ERV or something like that like yeah. you're filtering the air that's coming in and out of the house or at least into the house Oh, which is nice. Those um, those systems are cool. Like yeah. I, when I first heard about it, I'm like, oh, it's just a fresh air fan. They're, they're literally air. They 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 transfer the hot or cold from the one going out to the one coming in, 
and they, they're really sophisticated. So when you see the price tag, you're like, oh, that kind of makes sense. <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> Although, because it's more common, the prices are coming down, and more manufacturers are producing them. So um, it's an easier, uh, you know, sell to sell to a stomach or whatever. You know, it's like okay, like it's it's making more and more sense. What does ERV stand for? It's an energy recovery ventilator, um, which is normally what you would find here. There's heat recovery ventilators as well, but. Um, the ERV is is more common because it does both Correct. hot and cold yeah. exchange. So you don't. I'm just following up on that. So you don't check like EPA maps or anything like that to see where a property is relative to a known brownfield or something like that. No, um, we don't do that. Um, I, I'm sure there are environmental scientists that that are more geared towards and knowing. Um, specific sites in Rhode Island or Mass that are like, okay, like they're, they're zeroed in on that. That's not something that we really, you know, we, we look at the the surrounding in a, in a kind of a, a general inspector way, kind of. So if you're near the, the 95 corridor, it's like, okay, like they've done so many studies about um, the levels of as, asthmatics uh, in that area. And it's, you know, usually kind of a depressed area um, where there's not a lot of, um, of recourse. Um, that's that's something that you know we're familiar with, um, but as far as you know, getting out and there's brown fields and that sort of thing, it's you know unless a homeowner brings it to our attention as a concern, it's not something that we would normally pick up on probably. Yeah, it, it's a tough one to even know what to look for, you know. Because you're more concerned about sealing the house up, right? With I mean, that stuff, generally still speaking, leaking inside. If there are toxic levels of um, certain types of pollutants in a house, um, they're going to be there, you know, whether or not it's been you know, made energy efficient, but they're going to be much higher if it's energy efficient. So, I mean, obviously the problem is remediating the source, but um, I just am more and more aware of situations where, you know, there are brownfields and um, pollutants um, that are left over from industry yep. that homeowners are not aware of. Yep. The EPA's just, got pretty extensive lists, and I think yeah, you can just, maps yeah, too. you can look it up and, and find out pretty easily um, areas of concern, and if and if you live in one of those, uh, you know, deal with it at that point. Um, there's so much that you can get into, and like I mentioned earlier, like like I want to start doing radon testing because it really goes hand in hand with yeah. making a house really tight. Mm -hmm. We're also, you know, uh, indoor air quality is, is a big deal, and I'm studying, you know, there there are uh, uh, certain things you can use to test indoor air quality that you can buy for like two or three hundred dollars. It's like it only touches on a couple of things, but the really good ones are like ten thousand dollars, and typically you lease those, uh, which normally would be the direction I would go in. But there just hasn't been a demand for it as much. Mm -hmm. um, so as that becomes more of a part of the conversation, it's definitely something we'll do, and it would be on an individual basis, not necessarily oh this neighborhood has this, but like hey if you're concerned, we can come in, test your air, and and test for multiple things, carcinogens and like all that stuff. Uh, clearly at a cost, but um, try to get the big picture. Honestly, the old ones, I mean, some things are going to vaporize and some things aren't. It's more the more recent pesticides and things that will mm. be carcinogens. Some of the early things would probably be heavy metals that may not even vaporize. They'll be in your soil, but some not move into your house. Yeah. Like. So. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm teasing. Like some of the most toxic things would be greatest things for a house in terms of preserving um, it. Used, yeah. as cos used as <laughs> cosmetics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I don't know how the Victorians you know, lived things. very long at all. They did. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, no, they didn't. <laughs> so, um, the, the, there, was a, there was a question I had too. Um, oh, have you ever run across a pre-1950 house that you had to put an air exchange in? Um, we've made recommendations. Um, we, I don't know if it was pretty 1950s, but you know, there, so I'm thinking we went to a house that was crazy it. tight yep. and the guy was an engineer and he had gone crazy in his house and he did like all sorts of things. Um, and it was, we were like, wow, good job, but your house is too tight. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, oh, wow. Like that, he made his own beer and whiskey yeah, and all that okay. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's the, other, yeah, the other interesting thing uh, that that we've seen 
is like you'll go into a development and, it, and it's so rare to have uh, multiple say audits like on the same street or development or whatever but every once in a while you would you would fall into that that spot and you test a few houses and they'd come in at a certain number and then you'd hit one that's really tight come to mm -hmm. find out it's the it's the developer and the builder of that mm -hmm. flat mm -hmm. and, and that was his house so he's paid he paid extra attention to it and i've seen that happen two or three times it's like oh that's dirty like whatever but it's it makes sense right you're going to pay way more attention to the house you're building for yourself not that it was too tight but it, it's interesting because it's all the same building materials, same model, same everything. It's just attention to detail that that shifts it and it, and it makes it that much better. It, it's so simple and, and it doesn't have to cost a lot of money, at least in the new construction um, part of it. When it's all done and said and you've been living in the house for a hundred years, then it's how do, you, how do you get behind those walls? And So I think most don't get that tight. And also I think if you, you're right, if there's, let's say you're uh, on Manton Ave, you know, in some of those developments and, and, you know, or I know near Houghton Street off of Branch Ave, um, they had, uh, uh, they were doing a lot of, uh, it was a tanning facility. Yeah. Oh, um, so there's a lot of arsenic yeah. in the ground, yeah. you know. So I'd say with areas like that, yeah, perhaps if you're going through the, the process of, of uh, making your building tighter, you can bring in certain environmental folks to do stuff like that. I mean, it. Now everything has sort of gotten so specialized and separated, it might not be someone like Ken you're hiring to do that level of testing. You know, he's sort of getting the house to a certain point, and then you're hiring an environmental uh, uh, consulting company that is going to do its own air monitoring testing uh, to then determine what's in your air. So I think my concern is that um, homeowners, a lot of home homeowners aren't thinking about that, that at all. Yeah. And they're yeah. like, oh, they're going to come in and test and make my home more efficient. And they assume that you're just going to test for whatever they should test for. Right. So I, I would just say that, you know, it would be a good thing to be aware of where those types yeah. of sites are and to, you know, ask homeowners if they would consider um, having sure. someone come in and do environmental testing before you tighten it up because it yeah. could actually be exposing them to even more. I think you're right on, and I, th I think the trend is going in that direction. There's legislation for, um, say, for landlords uh, mm -hmm. to um, do the uh, the home energy score. Some some communities are doing that for for home sales and, and whatever, but the, but they're talking about it for landlords to uh, have it done so that tenants will come in and and on. have an idea of of how efficient that apartment is going to be. Yeah. There's there's nothing in place like that now. I think that makes all the sense in the world, and I and I think that to your point, like it's just awareness. People are becoming way more aware, and it's just a matter of there being an issue and, and, and going public. And people are like, hey, you know what? I want to know about that. Like, like, is there a website where I can say, okay, I'm thinking of buying a house here. What it's are the environmental things going on? You know, what I mean, what's going on in that neighborhood? And I think it's it's going to happen. It's, It'd be interesting to actually have an energy score for a building. As you're buying it no matter its age that's because they all lie i mean any any house i've bought they're like oh it only costs you know a hundred dollars a month to exactly this place so so yeah. we're our house that's was something that we would do 10 times that um, and we're just kind of waiting for that switch to, to like turn that. but go in and, and rate the house it's, it's not like as involved as an energy audit it doesn't involve a blower door test which i think is stupid but it becomes a big deal if you're going to require that for every single home purchase so i, I get i get that end of it but it's like looking for uh insulation what kind of heating system there is um, i think there might be a review of of uh, utility bills and spitting out a number from one to ten saying your house is an eight good job or even help you know i'm talking about mold and you know. yeah i mean that's something you know I, i'm not sure how that comes up because then all of a sudden it's like you you need to um if you see something, you need to report it, right? So um, then, it, then it makes it really hard to sell that house for the homeowner. But the so. questions are there. It's whether or not the seller is going to be honest about. Well, it has to be someone certified to do it. It wouldn't be the oh. it wouldn't be the seller being able to fill it out. We don't need so. more layers, but uh, you know, yeah, <laughs> we can dream. So, does anybody have any other questions? I mean, I don't know. We feel like we've. You guys have any? I'm else? done. You done? <laughs> <laughs> You know you're only a couple blocks from a remediated brownfield, don't you? Oh, you mean down the hill? Steel Yard, mm. on the other side of the river. 
Uh, wasn't there Locomotive Works? Didn't they have a lot of stuff mm -hmm. there too? A lot of bad Tom things, P PCBs and all that fun stuff. Yeah. Everything. Oh, this whole area is, is I mean, uh, fortunately we're on a hill, so most of the junk fell. That's what I figured. I'm the highest the house in the neighborhood. I figure I'm okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we were, we were <laughs> in Atlanta. Was a problem. Yeah. 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 Ye